Good morning and a big welcome to all attendees today to this webinar. My name is Chris Yelland and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. I will be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. The webinar is organized and hosted by EE Business Intelligence and co-hosted with the Minerals Council of South Africa and the Energy Intensive User Group. The webinar focuses on self-generation, embedded generation, distributed generation, wheeling and trading of renewable energy up to 100 megawatts. We have assembled a balanced lineup of presenters to provide energy intensive users and mining companies with valuable information and options when considering renewable energy and energy storage opportunities up to 100 megawatts. A big welcome, therefore, to Roger Baxter, the CEO of the Minerals Council, and to Jevin Martin, a chairman of the Energy Intensive User Group, who will be participating in the webinar today. A big welcome also to the other presenters and panelists here today, namely Ronald Marais of Eskom. He's in the Transmission Group and is involved very much in the whole area of grid access. Uh, to Jay Govender, an independent legal expert in this field. Uh, to Rob Futter, who is the CEO of Cresco, an advisory company in this field. Uh, to Steve Harrison, a director of Murray and Roberts. And to Richard Doyle, CEO of Dewey South Africa. Dewey, of course, is a, a developer and uh, Murray and Roberts has many roles but primarily in the sector plays the role of an EPC. And of course, a big welcome to you, our audience, which truly comprises a who's who of the energy intensive and mining industries of South Africa. So may I extend apologies firstly from Karen Breitenbach, the former CEO of the IPP office and now the CEO at Juniper Consulting, who was to be a presenter today but who is currently in hospital and therefore unable to present. Corin, on behalf of the presenters, panelists, and all of the attendees today, may I wish you a speedy and full recovery. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download all the presentations will be, a will be made available in the next day or two to all those who registered to attend. So while the presentations are in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility. Please use the Q&A text facility and not the chat facility, which you will also see on Zoom. The chat facility is really intended uh, for communications between uh, myself and the presenters. So the proceedings today are as follows. Firstly, I will call um, uh, firstly, I'll call on Roger Baxter and Jevon Martin to make some opening words to you on behalf of the Minerals Council and the Energy Intensive User Group. Then I'm going to say a few words to contextualize the economic, energy and electricity environment in which we find ourselves and give some thoughts on the subject of self-generation, embedded generation, distributed generation, wheeling and trading of renewable energy up to 100 megawatts in order to set the scene. Next will follow uh, three 20 minute presentations. Ronald Marais will cover issues around grid access and grid constraints and the ESCOM processes and requirements to connect and wheel electricity. Jay Govender, South Africa's leading energy and infrastructure legal expert, will cover the various legal, environmental, regulatory and planning hurdles that you will need to be aware of. Rob Futter is the CEO of Cresco Group and he will look at what has to be done by energy intensive and mining companies to close deals and fill the gap that's emerging between supply and demand in order to overcome the challenges and provide solutions. Then we're going to have a 10 minute comfort break and thereafter uh, I'm going to give the opportunity uh, uh, for five minute opening statements to be made by each of our four panelists, Steve Harrison, Richard Doyle, Roger Baxter and Jevin Martin. And this will then be followed by interactions between myself and the panelists for about 20 minutes and then an open Q&A session with you, the audience. So while the presentations are in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility 
and not the chat facility. I will also be taking verbal questions from selected participants who may put up their hands uh, to ask questions during the Q&A session. So I'll keep my eyes open for people with their hands up and I'll come to you, uh, to you so you can then pose your question verbally. You'll need to switch on your microphone at that point uh, in order to do so and I'll remind you. So without further ado, um, I'd now like to hand over to Roger Baxter, uh, the CEO of the Minerals Council, for his introductory remarks. Roger, over to you. Uh, Chris, thanks very much. And thanks very much to EE Business Intelligence and Chris, you personally, for helping to put this, uh, this whole panel together uh, and this whole webinar together. Colleagues, uh, the Minerals Council, the EIUG uh, and FARPA, the Ferro Alloy Producers Association of South Africa, um, have worked closely together to, uh, work, you know, to try and enable um, a much more business-friendly environment for investment in self-generation um, you know, by engaging government extensively on the different issues. We all know we're in a major electricity crisis. We all know that the shortage of electricity, electricity is a binding constraint on growth. And so this uh, webinar is very much a private session designed to really focus on how we can unlock uh, I mean, obviously, we've, a lot of us have got a pretty good idea what's happening, but we thought let's assemble a real panel of experts to give us some insights and to get us uh, to give us ideas that we don't know about uh, to help us to take the process forward, particularly in our lobbying activities with government. So, Chris, let me hand back to you. I'm looking forward to the session, and uh, um, it's going to be something where all of us are going to learn, and hopefully, we'll take away a huge amount to get the process really going in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much there, um, Roger, uh, for those words and um, uh, yeah, to, to uh, begin this, uh, this process. And so now I, uh, I'd like to call on Jevin uh, from the Energy Intensive User Group uh, also to just make a, a few opening words of welcome uh, to the audience, many of whom are your members, Jevin. Uh, so over to you uh, for your opening words. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Roger. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the Energy Intensive User Group. Uh, we are a nonprofit company that was established in 1999. Uh, we advocate for the energy rights of our member companies. Uh, collectively, we have 27 uh, member companies that consume about 40% of the electricity consumption in South Africa and produce 22% of South African GDP. As energy intensive users in South Africa, we find ourselves at the nexus of climate change, a global energy transition and a energy crisis here in South Africa. Climate change uh, presents us with both risks and opportunities, but requires us to fundamentally change the way we do business and source energy to contribute towards mitigating climate change. Uh, as energy intensive users, we are expected not only to set climate change targets, but actively decarbonize our value chains in order to remain relevant and globally competitive. We're fortuitous in that the global energy transition has presented us with technologies that would enable that, including wind, solar, storage, and hydrogen, but it requires that we develop new skills in order to integrate these into our business and reap the benefits in terms of decarbonization and commercial savings. Combining these technologies with um, innovative business and financial models uh, will unlock new opportunities for us. Uh, it will also allow us to address the energy crisis here in South Africa. The deployment of generation for own use will help close the national electricity supply deficit. It will enable us to ensure security of supply for our own operations, as, as well as stabilize electricity costs for our own operations. Uh, we've unfortunately endured 15 years of degradation of um, ESCOM's generation performance, endured load shedding, load curtailment, and topping that is above inflation tariff increases. This is obviously then a big opportunity for us, but as you, if you can ask anyone who's tried to pursue these projects before, we face a huge amount of hurdles and extremely long lead times to deploy them. So as energy intensive users, we need to advocate for an enabling electricity supply industry that supports of, of self-generation, but it is also beneficial to all stakeholders through a just transition. Uh, we also need to ensure that we have the, the correct skills, capabilities, and partners in South Africa to navigate this new paradigm and really unlock the space. So I'm personally excited today, given the lineup of experts, uh, the hot topics and the closed forum that allows us to really gauge in detail um, 
we also, uh, will, for those that are advanced in the strategies, will really uh, give us an opportunity to ask probing questions. And those that aren't as advanced to really leapfrog this. So thanks again to Chris and team uh, from the EIUG. We look forward to engaging today. It's an exciting session. Thank you. Thank you for uh, those introductory words, uh, Jevin. And uh, it's really now my task to set the scene for today's uh, events, uh, really to discuss this environment that we find ourselves in in South Africa. And uh, in setting the scene, I'm sorry to say that it's not a very pretty one. Uh, but we have to know where we are and we have to know what we have to do uh, in order to uh, find the necessary solutions and move, move forward. So on the economic front, uh, you know, I think there's, we all know this. We're in a very low growth uh, path at the moment. In fact, uh, per capita, uh, our uh, GDP is declining um, because the population is growing faster than the economy is growing. Uh, and on top of that, in this low growth uh, scenario, we've been hit with the COVID pandemic, which has really, uh, uh, you know, been a, a, a severe blow, a body blow. Uh, and we are familiar with the fact that South Africa has fiscal constraints. Obviously, downturn in business means lower tax collections, and we're having difficulty uh, servicing our debt uh, at higher uh, cost. Uh, to take out new debt. So the economic environment, I'm not going to dwell on. We're going to hear the uh, budget speech shortly, and we're going to hear the state of the nation shortly, uh, and, and, and these things will be covered in a lot of detail. Uh, on the energy front, uh, and if we look at the energy policy environment, I think it can be summed up uh, to some extent with the word uncertainty. Uh, we are seeing conflicting messaging coming from the Presidency, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, the DPE and the DMRE, uh, and, and this accentuates the uncertainty in the policy uh, uh, space. And uh, our minister, our energy minister and his department do not appear to be focused on short-term solutions. Uh, they are talking a lot about uh, clean coal technologies, carbon capture, uh, use in storage, uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, procurements, and even small modular reactors, uh, and none of these are, are short-term solutions. Uh, in addition to that, I just give my own view that I think our energy minister is seeming to be out of step with his cabinet colleagues, and, um, and this adds to the conflicting messaging and uncertainty facing our sector. In the environmental space, uh, sorry, in the regulatory uh, environment, um, we are witnessing a toxic relationship between NERSA, the regulator, and ESCOM. Uh, there have been a number of what I think are very poor decisions by NERSA that have led to legal challenges uh, by ESCOM uh, to take these matters on review in the courts. And this has uh, introduced uh, significant delays and indeed cash flow problems um, uh, with ESCOM, which now that the courts have reversed some of these poor decisions, is going to mean a catch-up, uh, and this is going to present a further price, upward price pressure on top of the normal multi-year price determinations, uh, as they claw back past uh, revenue that they were not able to get uh, from the regulator. Um, I think it's uh, uh, clear to most people that there are indeed significant capacity and competency issues at NERSA. Certainly the number of legal challenges that they have lost uh, indicates uh, this uh, lack of capacity and comp competency. NERSA itself has acknowledged publicly that the regulations and methodologies that they use in the regulatory process are no longer fit for purpose. Those are their own words. And therefore, there is a need for regulatory and tariff reform, and this needs to be done very carefully and properly. And already they made a move on, on the regulatory reform and reform and tariff reform, which was immediately challenged by ESCOM. Uh, and, and, and now they have to go back to the drawing board and do it properly. Uh, it cannot be a rushed process. The ESCOM environment, as we know, um, the issue of sustainability of the ESCOM business as it stands is under question. Uh, financial sustainability, operational and environmental sustainability are all coming together in a perfect storm. 
Um, there are no solutions that are coming uh, that I'm aware of for debt relief. It's been talked about for a long time. You know, what has to be done uh, to ensure the financial sustainability of Eskom and to relieve Eskom of its burden of debt, which is not able to service. Uh, and it uh, has led to uh, a utility debt spiral where Eskom is borrowing new money at higher interest rates in order to pay back existing debt at lower interest rates. Uh, and this is the so-called uh, debt spiral that Eskom finds itself in. Um, secondly, uh, Eskom is in a, a death spiral, and the death spiral, I think, refers to the fact that the increasing upward trend in prices is leading to lower demand. Lower demand uh, means that Eskom has to put up its price further in order to recover its fixed costs. And so you have this up, up spiral of declining demand and increasing costs, uh, which uh, takes the utility nowhere. And, uh, of course, uh, one has to, uh, to to alleviate all these things. One has to get involved in restructuring of the Eskom business. And the first step in this is the separation of transmission out of Eskom to become an independent grid company. Uh, and, and, and this is happening, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But in the meantime, we're seeing that the, the dysfunctional regulatory process is continuing. Eskom has put in the price application of 20%. And of course, there's a clawback of probably another 20, 10%, uh, depending on uh, the outcome of a court appeal. Uh, and this presents a massive threat to the economy. Uh, and the only solution that Eskom seems to be publicly placing uh, before the regulator at these hearings is to raise the price. And I asked the question, is this the only solution? Uh, I, I'm sure raising the price is part of the solution, but we cannot raise the price by 30%. Uh, which if you add 10% uh, from the clawback plus 20% from Eskom's application, it's simply not sustainable for the economy and there need to be a whole lot of other things done at the same time, like uh, tightening one's belt, like reducing staff complement, like reducing staff re remuneration, uh, like selling assets, like listing on the stock exchange and unbundling Eskom generation. Um, like government bailouts, a whole uh, you know family of interventions that need to be taken, improved energy efficiency. Uh, yeah, I, I can't go into them all, but there there is a whole family of interventions that could happen. And what we're seeing, un unfortunately, is simply a price application, as though that is the panacea to all the problems. It may be the panacea to Eskom's problems, but it won't be the panacea to your problems and the economy's problems. In the municipal environment, of course, uh, things are not pretty either. Uh, there is a failing service delivery at uh, local government level, especially at the smaller municipalities around the country. Um, they're, 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 the high prices for commercial and light industrial um, business uh, and, and customers in the municipal areas uh, are really problematic. Um, and um, many municipalities are in a real debt to, to Eskom and, and don't pay Eskom. Um, so they are get subject to load reduction, which impacts on the customers within the municipal sector. Um, they, they, they have an inability to provide free basic electricity, which is uh, you know, a, a, a government policy to provide a certain amount of free basic electricity. They get the money from Treasury to do this, but they use that money to run their business. In other words, they don't give free, but they take the money, but they don't give the free basic electricity, and they use the money from the treasury for free basic electricity to fund their own business activity, which was never what was intended. Big problems there. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, there are efforts to secure exclusive executive authority by municipalities for electricity articulation throughout South Africa, including in the Eskom uh, areas, and uh, they are wanting to be able to raise levies. Municipalities want to raise levies on the sale of electricity by ASCOM, just as they do on the sale of electricity by municipalities. So they, they're hungry for money. Uh, and and uh, one way of doing this is to apply levies on the sale of electricity to ESCOM. And if they have executive authority uh, in, in, in electricity reticulation, they will do just that. They also complain that the uh, ESCOM uh, prices to mines and industry, they, they, they want them to rise to municipal levels. In other words, for Eskom customers like mines and, and energy intensive industries to, to, to rise to municipal levels so that there is a consistent pricing 
uh, at tariffs set by municipalities. Obviously, this presents an existential threat to Eskom distribution, uh, but also a major threat uh, to energy intensive users, the mining industry, and in fact, every customer in South Africa and the economy as a whole. For energy intensive and mining environment, uh, obviously the, the challenge is to remain competitive and to control costs in an environment where electricity price appears to be out of control. Uh, and to try and secure sight, a line of sight of the electricity tra trajectory going forward, and not only to be able to see the trajectory, but to have a means of, uh, of limiting that tra trajectory. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that is through uh, renewable energy and wheeling of power. Uh, and lastly, of course, security of supply is critical for your operations. And we do experience load shedding. Uh, I think the mining industry and large industry experience load curtailment or supply curtailment uh, and the need to reduce load uh, when the system is under pressure. Uh, but through all these negative things that I've said, uh, there are some green shoots that are worth bearing in mind. Firstly, the relaxing of the licensing requirements for IPPs and mines and industry and municipalities, the so-called 100 megawatt uh, threshold above which you need a license uh, is, 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 is what I'm talking about. Um, what we see also is that the private sector is starting to assert itself and to be part of the solution. And mines and energy intensive industry are taking, starting to take ownership. I won't say it's um, uh, totally pervasive, but they are starting to take ownership of their own energy future. And of course, this will relieve the burden on Eskom. Eskom is restructuring and taking shape uh, is this new transmission grid company uh, which uh, was set up by the end of December, but still has to be ratified by the shareholder, which is government. So at the moment, uh, government is um, holding things up. Uh, but uh, Eskim has done what it said it would do and had to do. Uh, and it's this uh, establishment of this transmission grid company, I believe, is absolutely critical to ensure investment and level level playing fields in the sector, in the in the grid. The grid, and we're going to hear from Ronald. Uh, is, is requiring significant investments in order to accommodate uh, the future energy mix. I also think a green shoot is this new vision at Eskom regarding the decarbonization and the just energy transition. And they've, we've heard about the announcement that they're going to uh, be leasing or selling assets of land and grid connections uh, in areas where they're decommissioning old coal-fired power stations uh, in order for the private sector to uh, take up uh, quicker uh, the options of, uh, of, of renewable energy and uh, supply uh, into the grid to, uh, to replace the, um, the decommissioned coal. And um, lastly, I think uh, both renewable energy and battery energy storage are starting now to take center stage in the energy sector, in the electricity sector, certainly. And, and that's a part of the green shoot. So there are a number of green shoots which we should keep our eye on. And the objective of today is to, uh, to try and unharness and unlock the potential of the sector and to uh, see what uh, customers can do to become part of the solution and take ownership for their own energy future. That's all I want to say. And, and, and uh, therefore, at this point, I'd like to uh, now hand over uh, to Ronald Marais at Eskom. Uh, Ronald, if you can now take over and switch on your uh, camera and microphone and share your presentation. Uh, and introduce yourself uh, and, uh, and and give your presentation. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you. Uh, just confirming you can see my presentation. Um, we can't see your presentation yet. Do. Uh, can you share it? Have a look there. Yes, we can see it perfectly it now. Thank you, Ronald. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, um, my name is uh, Ronald Murray. I, um, I work at ESCOM in the grid planning area, which is a department in uh, transmission. And it produces, it has three areas. Um, it uh, looks at custom applications at, on the transmission system. Uh, it produces the transmission development plan. And then there's a strategic grid focus, uh, which uh, produces the um, uh, GCCA, the Generation Connection Capacity Assessment, and also formulates the uh, long-term uh, grid impacts and assumptions for the for, for the TDP. 
Uh, the presentation today um, is really going to give an overview of, of, of the grid, some grid impacts, um, and I hope, hopefully it will provide you with uh, some insights. All right, just a quick overview uh, in case there's people on the call who uh, don't have a full perspective of, of the South African grid. Um, the demand is around about 35 gigawatts, uh, 205 terawatt hours. Um, the load is distributed in very concentrated areas, dominantly in the north in Kharteng, KZN, and then spread around the coastal areas um, and uh, a little bit in the central of uh, South Africa. The, the distribution could be marked off by a red line across the country, where 78% is north of the red line and about 22% south, south of the red line. The current generation is dominated by a, gener a coal fleet. Um, and then we have introduced about 6,000 uh, megawatts or six gigawatts of renewables. And they're really distributed uh, across the country, um, but dominantly in the south, uh, of, uh, south of this line. But if we look at the distribution of, uh, um, of the generation, 78% uh, of the capacity is installed in the north of the country and 21% in the south. Now, the transmission grid really um, uh, delivers the power uh, in a reliable way to the, the load. And as you can see, um, the dominant network is in, in, the, in the north, uh, which is really part of the, uh, of the load and the generation, which is quite well balanced at this stage. Um, and then the remaining of the load, we have uh, what we call the Cape Corridor, which is a 765 and 400 kV corridor that moves the power to the various provinces. And then we have thin arterial lines supplying the remaining parts of, of, of the country. And it is in this central point where we have large uh, forecasted decommissioning of the coal fleet. And uh, this changes this historical dominant flow from uh, a, a central point to the rest of the country and uh, has, has many different Im implications. When we look at the uh, evolution of the generation, um, we can see the dominant coal uh, that we come from, um, but we see a rapid change uh, up to uh, 2030. And we expect if the IRP gets redone, uh, perhaps that change will increase because the IRP still introduced a number of coal plants, et cetera, and uh, the economics may have changed um, and the prices may have changed. So uh, the IRP only goes up to 2030. So there's a bit of a void beyond the 2030 and the review of the prices. But even if we look at the current IRP, there's about 30 gigawatts or more that will need to be installed um, by the 2030 mark, which is not an insignificant amount uh, to be implemented in this time period. What is important is the balance or the distribution of the, of the load across the country. Very often in the uh, energy planning models and in people's minds, um, we have the, the, uh, the, the load and we have generation and they simply deliver seamlessly to each other. And it, it does do that as long as the transmission network is well developed to provide the connectivity for any time, anywhere supply. And if we look at the distribution of the uh, load across the country, there are two dominant load centers, Gauteng and KZN, which are almost 50% or more of the country's load. Uh, the remaining load in the north are, are, are dominated by really the Rustenburg and Pumalanga area and then Limpopo. So very specific areas of dominant load and mainly in the north. On the coastal points, Cape Town is the dominant area or the, the peninsula area, uh, and, and then uh, in the Eastern Cape as well. But if you look at the vast majority of the, the, the land area that is south of the line that I drew earlier, you'll see that there's very sparse um, load that is in the area. So if you just sum up these three, it's about 4,000 odd megawatts. And if we draw a line across this, area between the south and the north, the total load at its peak in this area is around just over 6,000 megawatts. Now, when we look at generation load balance, the first point is that the network historically would be fed from the north, which means that the networks 
are unlikely to be designed more than the load that it needs to be delivered. So the networks in these areas are, fit, are, are designed to meet the historical load and not much more than that. Um, and the balance of the generation within these areas, once it exceeds the local load, the power then needs to move beyond this area to be, feed the load in other areas. And as you can see, if this total load is 6,000 megawatts, we've already introduced more than 6,000 megawatts of renewables in this area. We've got Kuburg, which is close to 2,000 megawatts. We've got various OCGTs, et cetera, that have come in this area. So very quickly, we see the rapid um, capacity constraints emerging, and these are relatively long distances, more than 1,000 kilometers that we need to, to, to integrate. And the renewable requirement is between three to 6,000 megawatts per year that we need to introduce. In other words, if the average province is 2,400 megawatts, we are putting in more than one to two provinces worth of capacity per year to accommodate the renewables. And remember the renewables, the grid is needed at the time of renewable generation, which would vary across these various areas. And this is where the constraint emerges from. What is also interesting is that we've seen this flat line of energy across the, the, the period. So this is indicated by this line and really dominated by the constraints in generation across the country. So we've had this declining energy over this period over, over the time. But what is interesting is that the capacity required on the grid uh, in, indicated by the notified maximum demand of key customers has actually grown steadily every single year. So although there's an energy requirement to reduce, the requirement to have a reliable transmission grid and the, the increase the capacity to ensure that the, the security of supply is there has increased year on year. And the projections indicate that this will continue in time, placing a lot of pressure on the grid over these periods. If we look where the new load is being driven, uh, over the period there's a potential of almost eight gigawatts coming, but we'll see that it's still dominated in the north of the country. So a large amount of the, the new load, as well as the historical load, it needs to be delivered in the north of the country. There are some really promising areas where we see applications of load in the south. And this is very positive because if you add more load in the area where we have constraints in terms of generation, this offsets the generation constraint and alleviates the capacity. So adding more load and having more details and more certainty of when the load will come and how much it will come is really important for us. And having these engagements really allows us to identify better capacity amounts within the grid if we have greater certainty of when the load is coming on. And having the platform of the large users, this becomes a really important engagement to have a better understanding as a lot of these areas are the same areas that are targeted for the low cost uh, energy resources. So the question is, how do we deliver, how do we decide on where to develop the network? So generally our reference point guided by the um, grid code is to look at the IRP as a first reference. And what we see there is the vast majority of generation comes from wind and PV, 69%. Um, but we look at all the other areas, gas, coal, and uh, other requirements identified in, in the uh, integrated resource plan. The first point of call is to look at all the resource bases that we have for solar, wind, gas, um, coal, nuclear, et cetera. We identify all the various uh, potential areas where the resources are based. We identify all the environmental constraints because these would um, prevent some of the areas from being developed uh, in, in the various categories. And then we uh, have a look at um, the work being done by other areas in terms of positive and negative mapping to have a look at the remaining areas that are available for development in these different categories. What we then do is we, we use the work that was done by the um, DFFE and CSR to look at the viable uh, solar and wind resource areas. Um, 
we don't necessarily constrain these just to the renewable zones, but we have a look at all the potential areas that are identified. We also then have a look at the applications that we receive, um, as well as the EIA applications that are, uh, are processed by the DFFE. Um, and currently the EIAs, oh, there's more than 80 gigawatts indicating where people have uh, spent money to do EIAs. And we also then look at the current as well as the historical applications uh, um, that have been provided to um, uh, distribution and um, transmission. We then have a look at the economics, um, which has a look at the prime resources. The one on the on the on the left here is the the solar, and this is the uh, wind. And we have a look at the um, capacity factors that present these various areas to assist in allocating where the potential sites may be. The red areas, uh, the the red background of the areas, indicate um, the. Uh, greater economic potential and the darker black areas show weaker economic potential. The yellow shows the uh, solar areas where uh, they have potential sites. The green is for the wind and again the red shows the, the more valuable areas compared to the grey which are less, less valuable areas. We then test these assumptions with the latest bird window rounds and have a look at the economics, which bird windows, uh, which bids were preferred what were the pricing relatives within the different areas, and they relate very close to the assumptions that, that we make uh, in, in the lower graphs. We then rely on various uh, surveys um, that have been done, and uh, just to note that we are going to be initiating a new survey with the um, uh, renewable associations and uh, participants to assist in helping us identify where they would like to have access on the grid. Um, this helps us inform the near-term information sets to where capacity needs to be allocated and where grid needs to be developed. We then integrate all this information into an identified map, which then identifies the hotspots, areas where people want access to the grid. We then identify where to allocate the capacities, and this ends up into then the assumptions in the transmission development plan which is then given to the engineers to develop networks to expand the grids, which then comes out into the transmission uh, development plan. So the important thing here is that we really want inputs um, from the community who wants access to the grid to provide us with um, rich information that better informs us where access is required, how much, what type, when, and this helps us better inform information sets to where grid should be expanded and prioritized. Uh, when we look at the economics as well, this is work previously done by the CSR um, and uh, other institutions. And we have a look at the levelized cost of energy. In this case, the green area shows the favorable areas and the red area shows the less favorable areas. And, and what you'll see very glaringly is that you've got this north-south divide where the economics are very favorable in, in the south compared to the north, and the price, the relative price increase could be as much as 50% more expensive if the renewables are forced into the weaker areas, um, which would have a significant price impact uh, on, on the renewable resources. Um, so what does this mean for the transmission development plan? Well, the load, even with the increases, doesn't really change the load balance across the country. Dominant load is still in the north um, uh, with significant less in the south. It's almost an 80-20 split. But the generation mix significantly changes. About 52% of the installed generation will be located in the south, 48% in the, in the north. But what is, is not clear from this ratio is that this is the installed amount when you dispatch the plant for economic dispatch, this ratio could significantly increase much higher because you're dispatching the renewables when they're available and then uh, retarding down the generation from the coal fleet, adding more pressure to move power from the south to the north reliably. Um, and the moving of this power is distributed, wind, solar, across all of these areas. And when the renewables get produced, the network needs to be able to move it at that point uh, across the network. 
So what that means is that uh, significant new corridors need to be developed. The Cape Corridor, as you can see, is designed for about 4,500 megawatts. That's the, the load, less the Kuburg, that's six. That is the historical load that it needs to be supplied. And as you can see, there's, there's uh, 30 gigs that need to be uh, introduced. A lot of that comes into this area, which means that we need significant additional corridors to be able to move the power. Uh, we need to strengthen the central corridor, uh, which is the current backbone. And we need to introduce new corridors for the solar one in the north, as well as to move the power largely from wind and solar to the south, to the main dominant load centers, which is Gauteng and KZN. And these areas are the big areas of constraint. They are over very long distances, which, which requires significant consultation, not just with the EIAs, but also with the servitude rights and the ability to build. We also mustn't forget that the load is also shifting more towards the north, it appears, and that these networks, the increased load requires also strengthening of the grid as the flows that traditionally came dominantly from this area, um, we still need to feed that power through this network, but the flows change and the networks need to be augmented and increased flows from different areas will change the flows requiring different strengthening in the grid to move the power um, to reliability to re reliably to the existing and new load in the areas. In order to identify the capacity that's available for adding new generation, we released a document that's called the, um, the Generation Connection Capacity uh, Assessment. It's available on the ESCOM website. Um, I'll take you there now. Um, and you go to the ESCOM Divisions Transmission. And under the transmission, you'll actually find the transmission development plan, which will give you all the details of the expansions required and the cost associated with that. We also provide the auxiliary services, which details how much auxiliary services in which categories are required. And in this particular instance, the grid connection capacity. And this provides a report which details for every substation what capacity is available. And we provide a dashboard that provides a information set on um, the, the generation in the area. So just to give you a quick view, this is the ESCOM site, escom.co.za. You go to divisions, transmission. Uh, yeah, you can see the development plan, auxiliary services, and you go to the GCCA document. This will open this page. If you click on the dashboard, it will open the map. It shows you the various supply areas, what capacity remains. This is before bid window five, and the maximum at each of the substations. If you hover over any particular substation, it gives you four different limits. The first limit is the local substation limit. Um, uh, so that would require local strengthening. The second limit is the lines going out of the substation. The area limit is the clustering of the substations around that. And then the supply area is the total supply that it needs to uh, uh, provide. The black dots indicate where there's currently no capacity. The, uh, the yellow dot shows where there's limit capacity, less than 500 megawatts. And the blue dot shows you where there uh, is more than that. So you can zoom into any of these areas and identify the capacity uh, requirements that, that, that you need. Um, uh, what you'll see is that the, uh, the, the capacity is relatively limited and again, dominate, dominated by the limited load in the areas um, and requiring additional strengthening to uh, allow that capacity. The bid window five, the successful bidders also have an impact on this. Um, the map on the, the upper side here shows the blue dots are the successful bidders. The red dots are the unsuccessful bidders and the size of the dot indicates the price um, that, that they bid in. Um, uh, the lower one shows the wind um, and um, the same applies for the color of the dots. These graphs show the relative uh, uh, cost in all of these particular areas. And as you can see, this is Northwest, Limpopo, Free State is quite variable in range depending where you cite it. Northern Cape and Western Cape falls into this lower bound. For the wind, we can see that uh, the, the, the wind capacities fall the same. Eastern Cape, Western Cape, 
and a really niche one in KZN, which provided a, a successful bid. What we see is the dominant interest is in these areas identified with high potential renewables at lowest economic cost, uh, providing competitive bids for successful winners. Um, what we see as well is that the bubbles get bigger as you move towards the north. In other words, as you move away from the resource rich areas, the costs tend to increase. In the wind areas, we'll see the dominance is in the south with very little except for niche areas in the north. Um, and um, 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 this indicates the competitive nature of the resources bound in the south compared to the north. Again, reinforcing the, uh, the competitive least cost um, renewable resources requiring access and transmission expansions in the south of the country. If we look at the impact of the bid window five, even before bid window started, there was uh, extremely limited capacity in, in the entire area indi indicated by the uh, Northern Cape supply area. It's not the province uh, uh, names, it's actually the supply boundaries. Um, the Western Cape, um, after the allocation, only has 35 megawatts remaining in it. The Eastern Cape, 1,236, and the Central Hydro Corridor, only 660 megawatts remaining. Now, so the total combined south of this line is less than 2,000 megawatts. That's smaller than one bid window. And this highlights the, the need to expand the transmission um, business uh, and implement significant strengthening, which will result in a requirement for additional tariff to be able to implement these required uh, uh, strengthening requirements. However, that required cost alleviates congestion and makes the um, cost of generation, which is uh, more than 90% of the cost of the electricity more favorable. Hence, uh, a significant uh, um, favorable investment in transmission. So what does the TDP propose? Well, if, if you look at these constrained areas, the, the, the TDP proposes to increase strengthening to go beyond the borders of these constraints. So the constraint exists because the amount of power in this area exceeds the load. That means that the generation needs to move beyond these boundaries. So if you put a boundary out for the Western Cape, there's more generation than load. So we have to move this power beyond this boundary. And to do that, we need to build new lines. And that means that these are the particular lines identified, the 765 kV bulk carriers to move this additional capacity and create, uh, alleviate these constraints. In the Eastern Cape, the same applies. The way to, to uh, relieve the constraint is to add additional uh, network. A 765 KV is proposed to add capacity on and feed into the existing Cape corridor and alleviate the constraints along the hydro boundary as well as the free state, additional 765 KV is required. In other words, strengthening the 765 KV existing corridor is the initial key to drive the power in here and move it to the two dominant load centers, KZN and, and the Free State. In the Northern Cape, significant strengthening is proposed, both 400 KV and then future 765 KV corridor moving across to the, uh, to the Northern boundary. And can also identify- yeah, Can you start wrapping up now, Ronald? Yes, sure. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, so what has been done to alleviate this congestion in the, in the, in the, in the short term? So under investigation, there are four ways that we can do this. The first is curtailing dispatchable generation, whether ESCOMs or others, to enable additional renewables in the area, to implement storage to mitigate peak risks of congestion within particular areas. We can also look at voluntary uh, renewable curtailment. Uh, the renewables often have very small peaks that cause congestion, and if that's curtailed, it can alleviate it. And getting more details of and load in the particular areas. So the curtailment and dispatch is, is really only possible where there's existing generation, um, and it requires to be stable. Investigations indicate that this is potentially possible in the Western Cape, and it looks very favorable that we can increase some capacity within those areas. Storage really only works with clipping the peaks for the periods, and this is favorable for PV areas, 
So the Northern Cape is particularly favorable. However, the sites for the, for the batteries of, are critical to be at specific locations within the grid, else you can't achieve the desired increase in capacity. And the current studies are very positive to indicate that we potentially can add this additional capacity. Voluntary curtailment, this is really looking at with the IPPs how to uh, manage this risk um, and to see if connection can be made with a minimum amount of curtailment. And then, of course, increasing load really assists um, by knowing the details of the increased load adds capacity. Of course, all of these things require a stable grid, and this, this will not be compromised at any time. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ronald, for that presentation, a very valuable presentation. And just to assure all attendees <clears throat> that these presentations will be shared with you by email after the webinar in the next uh, couple of days. So don't worry, uh, you will have all the documentation, including a link to all the presentations. Uh, so thank you very much, Ronald. There have been a, a few questions to you, which we'll deal with during the Q&A. Uh, and in the meantime, we're now going to move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, which is uh, Jay Govender. And uh, Jay, I think, will introduce herself. Uh, but I know Jay as uh, South Africa's uh, leading legal uh, expert in this field of energy and infrastructure. Uh, and we're really pleased and honored to have you with us, Jay. But please also, can you do a little intro of yourself and uh, what you're up to? Uh, for our audience, uh, over to you, and if I may ask you uh, to share your presentation, please. Sure, thanks, Chris. I think you give me too much of credit, but thank you for that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jay Govinda. Um, I'm a practicing attorney based in South Africa. I've been in practice for more than 25 years um, and specializing in the energy and infrastructure sort of space. Um, until very recently, I held the position of the head of the energy sector group at one of the top large law firms um, and have recently left to go independent. Um, and, and just very quickly, some of my more notable instructions would have been, uh, for example, um, in REAP, I was Eskom's lead advisor for a period of 10 years. So I helped them close approximately uh, 95 projects. Um, I've also been in doing, a, did a similar piece in Ethiopia and helped their government and Ministry of Finance do their very first IPP project. Uh, I'm involved in a couple of truck cross-border transmission projects, generation projects, and importantly for the purposes of today, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved in a number of distributed generation power projects, uh, both a single project and a portfolio. So uh, Chris asked me to do a presentation. I assume it means that I must find a means to help the audience digest the legal jargon, Chris. But I, I do have a presentation. I'm going to try not to make it too legalese, um, but let me just share. Uh, Jay, uh, while you're doing that, just to say there is a, a quite a loud buzzing noise as you are speaking. I, I'm hearing on my side. I don't know whether any of the others are experiencing the same noise on their side. But um, uh, yes, is that any better? Yeah, no, it's not in. No, the buzzing is still there, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure. I don't have uh, earphones with me. Sorry. Mm. So I'm just going to. We'll just have to press on. on. We'll just have to press on, Jay. Yes. Okay. I apologize for that. I'm not sure how to resolve it. Okay. So um, today I just sort of wanted to go through the touch points and provide an overview of some of the challenges and perhaps more difficult issues that I may have experienced in closing uh, some of these captive projects, both from the lens of the developer and the off-taker. So I want to start off by just giving some context as to the legal and regulatory framework under which we are working. Um, and as, as Chris mentioned earlier, the focus of the session is really projects falling within the exemption related to district generation facilities with a, with a capacity cap of no more than 100 megawatts and which have a point of connection on the distribution or transmission grid. 
um, and and we all would know that exemptions were passed in October 2021. There's various categories of projects dealt with under the exemptions, but um, those power generation facilities are under of no more than 100 megawatts, which fell under the exemption provisions, which only require a registration and not a license, is where a facility is operated to supply one or more customers and there's no wheeling, or if there is a wheeling scenario, it's also allowed to supply one or more customers, but in the wheeling scenario, the generator also needs to enter into a connection agreement with the transmission or distribution uh, grid provider. Um, importantly, the regulations also provide for a category of an exemption when it comes to a distribution facility. And, and what it states is that where you are operating a distribution facility from your gen facility up to a point of connection, um, that jet distribution facility is exempt. And what that really means is that, um, you know, the distribution corridor that, that private sector IPPs would need to build to connect a uh, distribution facility that's maybe at a distance from where your delivery point is, that facility would fall under the exemption provisions. Uh, NASA has also provided, uh, uh, published a uh, um, guidelines and directives on the registration process um, that was published on the 10th of October 2021. And it's really very interesting. I'm not going to go into all of the details of the registration process. But, you know, IPPs or, or applicants would need to provide the PPA, the technical uh, details of their project, uh, the tariff that has been agreed under that project. And uh, what I particularly found interesting is that there is a registration database. And in the database, there's a whole lot of information that gets recorded and will be publicly available. But uh, the information on the technical stuff is really about installed capacity of the plant, uh, which is slightly different to how uh, it was dealt with in REIT, because as you know, in the gen licenses in REIT, your contracted capacity was what was recorded. So recording and install capacity, I think, is probably good for private sector, because I'm hoping that that means you can make an assumption that your the reserve capacity uh, in the registration process would be the installed and not the contracted. Um, then moving on to permits, authorizations, et cetera, and the challenges that I have seen. Look, approvals in a captive project does follow the normal course. And, and in um, utility scale projects procured by government, like REAP, the benefit of that pro program was that, you know, different ministries got together, probably agreed an MOU or coordination amongst themselves and helped facilitate some of those approvals. That facilitation process is not necessarily available to private sector. And, and my point is really not about cutting corners, but more about the importance of having approving bodies give private sector or captive projects equal attention to, to the utility scale ones. And, and um, we don't necessarily see that happening a lot. So the, some of the challenges is just that these approvals follow normal timelines in the sense of, and, and is given attention in a priority of, of when it's received, et cetera. Um, the other obvious challenge is the grid availability and grid congestion. I'm not gonna go into that because I think my colleague Ronald went into it in pretty good detail, but the challenges around grid, con um, grid congestion is like pretty obvious <laughs> following uh, Ronald's um, presentation. Um, Grid connection is probably another issue to, you know, to consider where there is lengthy timelines, but also 
The ESCOM process um, does not enable an IPP to provide farm prices at bid stage. What do I mean by that? For those of you who have been involved in other projects, you know that the ESCOM process is that you would need to apply initially for a cost estimate letter, then it's followed by grid studies, et cetera, a time and cost timeline assessment by ESCOM. Then they issue you with a budget quote, and that's only at budget quote stage where the prices become firm. If you as an off-taker are running a sort of bid process um, or in negotiations with an IPP, you would that IPP is only going to be in a position to provide you with a firm price on the grid connection at the time that it gets the budget quote, which in turn impacts the tariff on these projects. And so um, it's, you know, part of what we often have to discuss under the PPA is whether tariff adjustments are allowed because of the of an increase in a uh, grid connection cost, which wasn't prevalent in REAP because in REAP, as you know, the the you know the costs were locked in at PPA stage, and there was really no allowance under the renewable energy program for adjustments in in the tariff. So IPPs sort of took that risk. But these are the challenges in the captive space. Um, moving on then to PPA considerations. And really, I know I'm going pretty fast. And uh, this is just an overview, as I said, touch points of issues that one may, uh, one may need to consider. Um, maybe just one point that I possibly omitted on the approvals and challenges. In, uh, you know, I just highlighted or stated that the distribution facility that's attached to an exempt generation facility would also be exempt up to that point of connection. Those of my clients who are constructing their own distribution facilities, you know, even though they are exempt, they still need to secure way leaves. And, and way leaves uh, or servitudes also take a lengthy time and need to be factored into your planning. And it's particularly challenging where there's organs of state, because organs of state are creatures of statute, and they have to follow their own legislative or regulatory or approval process. And so that tends to delay uh, the construction of projects and, and those that are obviously like in the IPP space as participants, you know, it's, it's a key issue to take into account when, when determining not only your CP deadlines, but also like your scheduled COD, et cetera. Moving on to, to, the, to the PPA. Um, Typically, we see two types of projects. I would say the most dominant ones in the captive market right now, those that have direct connections, so a generation facility directly connecting to an off-taker, and then we have wheeling, uh, the wheeling transactions, um, and, and we'll get into the detail of wheeling in a little while, but the, the PPA then forms the core foundation of the contractual arrangement for the sale and uh, purchase of energy produced from the generation facility. Um, and, and generally, it's pretty negotiated. Again, in, in the renewable energy, there was a standardized PPA that was issued. And really, you had to bid into a risk allocation. And parties perhaps didn't spend adequate time really understanding what the risk is and what it means. But that's not the case in the capture space. So one has to really go into detail into uh, negotiating these PPAs. And just um, some of the off-taker typical concerns in a PPA is a, cu a couple of points. So in a renewable project, you, you normally have a take or pay regime. So these are self-dispatch uh, projects. And so the IPP would have an expectation that whatever they make available at the delivery point would be purchased by the off-taker. And that essentially is take or pay. But benchmark that against the off-taker load profile. And the off-taker's concerns are obviously, you know, having this obligation to take energy 
when their load doesn't really need it or they don't have the, the commensurate sort of consumption requirements. And then what happens under that PPA is that there's a deemed energy payment risk. In other words, you would have to pay for that energy despite the fact that you don't need it. But um, so, you know, we've had a lot of discussions around this point and really what it takes is that there has to be uh, an equal bit of homework on both sides, not only with the off taker really understanding your generation profile, but also having the obligation on that IPP to develop its own generation profile, which matches that load profile. Um, so as an off taker, you would want to interrogate that generation profile when you receive it. Um, allocation of third party risk. So again, in utility scale, where government could be responsible for a particular risk like grid risk, you know, um, it was easy to say that government would take that risk and it wasn't an IPP problem. In a captive scenario where you have two independent parties who are unable to manage this third party risk. And when I talk about grid risk, I mean like grid interruption and obviously like the concern maybe around, um, you know, one of the ESCOM's options that Ronald's just highlighted is curtailment. Um, curtailment risk means that there's, the plant is curtailed, there's a reduced revenue on the IPP side, there's security of supply issues on the off-taker side, and how one, does one deal with it in, under the PPA is something to, to uh, consider, because it's, it would be unfair if either party is, has to pay a financial compensation for a third party risk. So we typically, probably the easy way is to house it under force majeure and then allow an extension of time so that you can still get your revenues or your power, but at a later stage. Uh, but those are just one of the solutions. It's not the only solution. Uh, the termination payment for a dedicated plant um, is still, you know, there's an expectation, if, especially if these projects are project finance, that the full debt and equity gets paid. Um, and in those scenarios, off takers may then want an additional option to take transfer of the asset if you have the capability to operate it at that time. Um, but the, 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 obviously, these are high value projects and um, off takers then are concerned about the amount of that termination payment. Um, then going to the tariffs, um, again, off takers expect, uh, I, I'm seeing this more and more, there's an expectation for the tariff to be below the utility tariff. And the rationale is, why would I deflect off the grid to a private project if I'm not assured that I'm, ne I'm not going to be paying a tariff more than what I was paying before I deflected. And so as a result of that kind of script, we are seeing that there's more innovation around the tariffs. Um, even if you start off with a fixed tariff, which is escalating by indexation, for example, in some scenarios, I'm seeing the imposition of a tariff cap or alternatively an obligation that these tariffs must always be below a certain threshold below the utility tariff, or alternatively, some sort of savings model where that off taker is always assured that you would get a certain percentage of savings. And all of this then just adds an additional layer of complexity to how one determines your financial model, etc. And really understanding the market and understanding the trajectory, I suppose, of where utility tariffs are going to go to. Um, IPP concerns in these dedicated plants is obviously like what if the property gets disposed of? What if what if the off taker decides they are going to close down their production and there's this risk of a stranded asset? And in those scenarios, IPPs are expecting it to be a default scenario with full termination payment. Uh, but what we are trying to do is introduce mitigation measures 
where it's captive, especially now that there are wheeling options in the country uh, and, and looking at whether, you know, there could be mitigation by way of uh, introducing a third party off taker or a wheeling option um, to, to maybe another premises owned by that same off taker. But wheeling is also not easy and it requires really advanced implementation. And I'll come to what advanced implementation means. And lastly, um, security for payment obligations. IPP is always concerned about the ability of the uptaker to pay. Um, Chris? And Jay, if I could ask you to start wrapping up, please. Yes. Um, so there are procurement considerations. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but really where you enter into like MOUs or exclusivity agreements, it tends to be pretty messy if you want to exit. So I think there needs to be very careful consideration around um, whether you enter into exclusivity and lots of thoughts around what your procurement process is going to be or your approach. Are you going to go competitive or unsolicited? If you're going competitive, are you going open or a closed tender only to limited IPPs? And really good preparation on your procurement stuff. And then I just want to touch on wheeling because I think it's quite important. Um, so wheeling is a financial transaction transaction. It doesn't involve a flow of electrons from the generator to the customer. And because of that, it means that what wheeling really entails, and I'll really go very quickly into this, is that where there's a PPA, so between the generator and a buyer, um, there's a PPA entered into with the buyer. And, you know, um, and, and there, there's in order to enable this financial instruct, uh, transaction, a whole bunch of contracts need to be amended. So the existing use of system agreement with the, at the generation point would need to be amended. There's a wheeling agreement that's put into place. The electricity supply agreement that is currently in existence with the um, buyer needs to be amendment, amended. There would be wheeling charges that's going to be applicable and the rebates and credits that occur under that ESA is not the same as what the buyer pays under the, the PPA. So the PPA tariff versus the wheeling rebate is, is different. And so wheeling is, is complex. Um, as I said, it really requires a lot of homework and understanding. But um, Chris, maybe I'm going to stop there. I have two more slides, but I am out of time, and maybe I can take further questions in the Q&A. Uh, thanks very much, Jay. I appreciate that. And uh, may I again just apologize to the audience uh, for their buzzing noise. Uh, but I think, Jay, just to put your mind at rest, uh, that despite that, um, your voice was coming through loud and clear. So the, I think the messages were there. And again, to assure uh, delegates that they will be receiving all of these slides, including the two that uh, Jay has had to skip. Uh, but it also uh, means that I, I want to give a message to, to everybody here that uh, one of the purposes of the uh, meeting today is to connect attendees with people like Jay, with people uh, like uh, Rob Futter, uh, Richard Doyle, uh, 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 um, Steve Harrison, uh, and all the presenters, in fact, and, and including Eskom. Uh, uh, Ronald Maria, because it's important that you start engaging with these people. Uh, they are experts and they can assist you in various ways uh, in your thinking and your projects going forward. So I will, would like to and I will be introducing everybody to our participants uh, in the follow up report back uh, with their contact details uh, so that uh, you, the audience, can start engaging uh, with the panelists, uh, you know, one can only do so much in 20 minutes, but the conversation, of course, is much, much more complex and bigger than this. So uh, this is kind of an introduction and, and a lot of follow up work uh, will be possible uh, by you, the attendees uh, with our uh, presenters and panelists in due course. So thank you very much for, uh, for that, Jay. And it's now my uh, pleasure to uh, hand over to Rob Fata. Uh, uh, Rob, as I said before, is the CEO of Cresco, and Cresco is really, I would say, a leading deal maker um, in this sector. 
I know that at Cresco are doing major projects, including with Sassel and Air Liquide, uh, you know, in, in, in these projects which amount to something like 900 megawatts of renewable energy uh, being wheeled from a number of different generators to, uh, to Air Liquide operations uh, and, and Sassel and Secunda. So uh, I don't think we could have a better person to explain to you what these deals are all about and how to actually make it happen. It's all about solving problems. We're not here just to hear about the problems. We're here to deal with them and make progress on them. And I think uh, Robert is in an excellent position uh, to guide you, not only during this webinar, but hopefully thereafter as well. So with that, uh, Robert, over to you. If you could just introduce yourself and share your slide. I see it on the screen at the moment. Thank you, Robert. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for the very polite uh, um, introduction. Uh, owe you a round of golf for that uh, positive <laughs> choices uh, and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, Rob Futter here from Cresco. Apologies, I can't be in full PowerPoint mode. I'm more of a Teams guy than a Zoom guy. I haven't quite got it right. But um, what I was going to try and do is take what all the presenters have discussed and bring a slightly different angle to it and, and really wear sort of the, the buyer's hat and how do they start on this journey. And it is a journey. Uh, initially from sort of RFP procurement, PV and wind, battery, hydrogen, and then through this mythical place called net zero. For us, it's still mythical because I don't believe the technologies are there yet. Um, and then a lot of the, the lessons learned uh, from the process. Um, so at the moment, I'd say 60, 70% of the work that, that we are involved in is sort of on the left-hand block. And this is your typical journey that a buyer goes through. So it gets given a very aggressive renewable or decarbonization or net zero. You can use all these words in, interchangeably to a certain extent, uh, a target, uh, 2025, 2030, 2040, whatever it is. Um, every time there's a new press release from head office, the dates become earlier, but the percentages become higher is our experience for, for most uh, clients. And what we're mostly doing at the moment is, is getting involved in sort of this early energy strategy type work. And, and this energy strategy is less the sort of McKinsey Bain type stuff. It's more around what works and what doesn't work from a practical point of view. So is on-site worthwhile, is wheeling worthwhile, you know, is battery actually a realistic solution and, and how do you build in that? And at the moment, there's a no brainer. You should have done renewables a couple of years ago. Um, and the first opportunity is really to do an RFP in Wheeling, and, and as Jay mentioned there. So at, at the moment, we're doing a lot of work in, in the Wheeling RFP space. Uh, for many clients, they might have the opportunity to do on-site too, depending on their location, land availability. So alongside the Wheeling RFP might be an on-site sort of type of process, uh, or permitting process, uh, preferably done in-house. Uh, perhaps then through an IPP at our view, the IPP for that could come in later. And then most people are targeting sort of a 2025, 30% renewable penetration, uh, depending on your load and, and the availability there. And, and that's what we're currently in, involved in. And that's what I'm going to touch on for, for, for most of the slides going forward. Um, we then have sort of post this on-site perhaps generation coming online, the introduction of battery large scale or not, and, and maybe some other renewable interventions. Uh, this could be cogen and others. Um, we assume that most energy efficiency or, or small energy efficiency interventions have already been done, uh, light bulbs, um, process heat and steam and things like that. And then from there, you can maybe take the step change to this 50% renewable penetration uh, idea, probably requiring more wheeling, perhaps getting as much as on site and, and, and oversizing. Then we have the idea of hydrogen, long duration storage, all these other technologies that are in various stages of development, procurement, uh, you know, ranging from uh, projects that are perhaps in the ground, small scale to all due respect, sometimes uh, snake oil salesmen. So there's a lot of dispelling the myths and, and what's there and what's not there. And, and these technologies need to come on, online to get to the higher penetration levels. And then our view to get to this mythical 100%, there needs to be completely new technologies to get that last percentage in or a significant additional step change in, in the pricing. So a lot of the work we're doing for clients at the moment is actually drawing this roadmap all the way to there, conscious that um, sort of the new technologies is, is a bit more uh, pie in the sky, but the other technologies on the, on the left of the slide are very well developed and, and we have some very good experience and a history of what's there. 
and, and for many people, it's starting pre-feasibility studies on hydrogen, but doing bankable feasibility studies, if you can call that technical talk, on on-site renewables because because the technology is developed enough. But it's a super interesting space. Uh, it used to be a buyer's market. Now it's a, a seller's market, in our view. Um, all the low-hanging fruit, call it good sites, good transmission connections, and that have been captured by the REAP rounds. Um, Ronald did a great job of showing where the generation is and, and how the generation is changing over time as, as, as people need to chase other locations. But at the moment, everyone is out on procurement across the sectors, across the, te the, the technologies in different stages. Uh, we're currently involved in probably more than two and a half thousand megawatts of various um, procurements for various clients on different approaches. So some being on site, own it myself, others buying IPPs and others doing the traditional IPPs. And for every IPP solution, there's something in the middle. So in some cases, there's a lot of um, standardization that's going on. Uh, perhaps we, we're trying to, as much as possible, ensure some sort of standardization around some of the PPAs that we're involved in to achieve this thing called market precedent. But I don't know if that will ever happen. But, but each client requires something else and also has its own requirements. And then you have this thing called IFRS and other accounting related issues that also affects the, the procurement approach. But you know, as, as I said, we are aware of at least four to 5,000 megawatts of potential projects that are currently um, out there by large users outside of the EIUG and the manufacturer circles. And then this just, this excludes call it the rooftop solar space, residential, and then sort of the small commercial which is happening as we speak outside of the visibility and there's probably another two or 3,000 megawatts. So, you know, I think uh, Ronald's concerns earlier around the grid are gonna be exacerbated if all these projects actually do come online. And, and then I guess there is a little bit of a first move advantage in terms of um, getting these clients signed up. Now, this is the ESKIM view going forward uh, in a Cresco format. Um, and, and we know how the Megaflex tariffs will be restructured. So in our experience from RFPs, it, it, it takes a fair bit of due diligence, but it's, it's quite easy to firm up what the IPP tariff will be and what the risk adjustments will be to the IPP tariff between bidding and, and financial close. Um, what is much harder is translating that IPP tariff into a savings for the client. Um, and it's not because of the maths, we have the Excel spreadsheets and the abilities, but um, it's around understanding what will the ESKIM path, both in terms of escalation, but as well as restructuring of the tariff look like. Now we have a fair bit of um, confidence in terms of how ESKIM plans to restructure their tariff and, and the ESKIM pricing team, Shirley and Keith Bone have been very good in sort of communicating to the market what their plans are and, and obviously what the thinking is. But unfortunately that's sort of only looking at a two or three year ahead um, uh, view. And for the majority of most of our clients, the majority of the PPA period for most of the generation is coming online is actually 2025 onwards. And, and that means that to a certain extent, we crystal ball gazing around what the ESKIM price will do, how the tariffs will change, how the variable versus fixed components uh, will be adjusted that'll affect the savings over time. And that's probably uh, many cases for most of our buyers, the most difficult decision. It's not around which IPP has the best site or which tariff is good. The PPA risk allocation is a, is a separate discussion on itself and we'll touch on that and I think Jay did earlier, but it's around what will this mean over 20 years? Savings in today's money using the current Megaflex structure is, is a no brainer. Um, ESKIM restructuring their tariff does reduce the savings, but there are ways of mitigating that. But um, going into the future, it's very much crystal ball gazing. And I guess this is where we, we talk about the day ahead market the bilaterals, the balancing generators, the cost of balancing power and, and things like that. And th this is where we're spending a lot of time with our clients is, yes, you have an RFP procurement. Yes, you'll get PV and wind and there's risk to, to ESKIM connection and stuff, but that can be uh, fairly quickly sort of um, risk adjusted or, or verified and the liabilities and the termination calculations are confirmed. But when the grid becomes where we think it's gonna be and gas power comes online, what will they charge for this balancing market? We have a very um, robust SAP market north of the borders. 
And, and there you can see significant differences in power between peak and off peak, 25 cents to five cents. And we believe that sort of uh, type of pricing, uh, preferably maybe not all in dollars there, but uh, will also be in the, in the South African market around balancing. And so for us, it's around uh, talking to our clients around this. Now, if you have one load and one IPP, it, it's pretty simple and you can do it in, in one single spreadsheet. When you start looking at our clients now who are starting to get to 50, 60% gen renewable penetration, you may be looking at six or seven IPPs, four or five sites or even more, it becomes really complicated. And, and we're having to build some very complex financial models that Excel just can't handle, especially when you start looking at hourly offsets. Um, the, the current view of uh, the current wheeling regime allows monthly reconciliations. You know, we believe that'll change to hourly. Um, the whole forecasting regime under REAP and Eskom's requirement for more forecasting shows that hourly offsets is going to become sort of the norm. And now clients are starting to work out, you know, where is this spilling risk? Some people call it or deemed energy risk. And what does that mean fi financially? So I'd say most of the work now is actually sitting in the strategy side saying, where do you want to get to and, and what are the risks in, in the system going forward from there? Now, just in terms of the, the Megaflex tariff adjustments, now these are the things we know about, uh, one, two, and three. So peak in the morning to the evening, this generator capacity charge, so taking a, a portion of the variable charges and turning it into fixed. Um, we, we need to understand the exact mechanism and see how that comes out in the bill, but we believe we understand it and model it correctly. There's, there's a rebalancing of the tariffs from standard and off-peak, and then I mentioned the, the balancing market itself. So there's a lot of things moving over time. And if I just take a simple example of the peak to in the morning to the evening. So in this uh, graphic, you can see the red is worth two and 50 or three rand. The green is worth 50 cents uh, on an offset basis. So you can see there's a fair bit of red in the top slide and the current time of use. But if you just move time of use from the morning to the evening, you lose a lot of the red and the savings significantly reduces. The counter to that is for wind, where you, you gain some of the red. So from the top, you have less red in the evening, you're moving uh, uh, to the evening below. But now if you start combining wind and PV, um, which is makes sense from a solution point of view, you can see here that sort of at four o'clock or two to four o'clock in the afternoon, using this wind profile, because we are conscious that different wind profiles give different approaches, the PV profiles are generally quite consistent, when you start getting above 30% renewable penetrations, you might have a situation where there's significant, call it spilling or deemed energy risk because if the wind blows and the PP generates all at two o'clock, you can see that's probably significantly higher uh, output. So this is all part of the analysis that, that we're doing for clients as part of the bigger impact. Um, and as we said, the, the way we've typically taken uh, these approaches with clients is the IPP looks after its risk, and the buyer needs to look after its own risk, which means its um, load center, as well as its relationship with Eskom and vice versa, the Megaflex tariff impacts. Uh, it, we believe it's very hard for an IPP to start taking a view on Eskom price increases or restructuring of tariffs. I know some buyers are allocating that risk to the IPP. In some cases, I guess the IPP perhaps is willing to take that, but, but we believe from a, a tariff point of view, it's probably not the, the best approach. And there's been a number of lessons learned from that process. Now, it's not all about today. Uh, it's all about what it'll look like over 20 years. So, so for us, NPV of savings is one of the key drivers, balancing that versus the termination calculations and the impact on the balance sheet and that, because ultimately finance signs off, even though it's, it's, it's very much a technical procurement to a certain extent. So we look at the buyer's inputs, we look at the seller's inputs, PV and load. We run it through the Eskom wheeling calculator um, to calculate the, 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 they call it the cost of wheeling, but you, you don't actually see a wheeling cost on your bill. It's the transmission losses, which we know is being restricted, restructured. And then we try and do a present value in today's money. And then from that, we run a number of scenarios around what will happen to the Eskom tariff and, and how did that, that NPV change? And there's no one answer, there's a range. And at the moment, all of the ranges that we've seen based on IPP uh, prices relative to Eskom price escalation and restructuring still shows NPV of savings. Those savings do decrease over time, but it's still a, a no brainer from a procurement point of view. 
Now, there's been a fair few lessons learned from the various RFPs that, that we've been involved in, as, as well as I think some of them out there. Um, uh, Chris mentioned earlier around, we wanna uh, get more of these projects on the, on the grid. I think in, in many cases, it's not Eskom who's holding this up, it's, it's either the private buyer not being able to make a, a, a decision or the IPP perhaps not being able to get to financial close, um, which are often interrelated. So for, for us, you know, the, one of the lessons is if, if you don't have a permitted site, don't go out on an RFP yet unless it's just to uh, get an environmental consultant uh, out there. This is for on-site, uh, for wheeling, it gets a bit more difficult. You know, we, this concept of shovel ready is, is coming out there. We don't have a defined definition yet. It's a bit like bankable. It means different things to different people, but, but there are sort of 25 permits that most projects need, not all of them applicable in everywhere. And, and some of those, the work we're doing at the moment is, is evaluating those projects, but um, you know, make sure you, you have plans in place to develop your site. If it's on site, if it's wheeling, the IPP's often done it or sometimes there's something in between. And we do see buyers also wanting to buy developed sites or developing sites perhaps to, to get access to better sites as part of their second phase um, sort of procurement, uh, renewable procurement processes and that. Um, the next one is we always suggest don't uh, quote it in the newspaper. Uh, one of our tenders we had, we had over a hundred bidders. I think the, the internet site crashed uh, and, and that ranged from the good, the bad, and the, the very ugly, or, or, or the Bucky Brigade offering to build 100 megawatts, and apologies for my South Africanisms there. So, but I mean, there are um, a bunch of credible IPPs um, out there. There's sort of various uh, sort of levels of IPPs, but you know, our suggestion is focus on a selected group, because in many cases, 95% of your answer will come from the same top 10, albeit that the top 10 perhaps have too many projects and you might have to go to the top 15 now. There's some really good sort of smaller IPPs coming online that, that can add some real value and have some good sites. Um, that often can slow the process down and, and just ends up, uh, and if you're a sensitive company that has sort of community related issues, which a lot of the mining clients do, often not having it uh, in the local newspaper uh, just saves you time and, and, and suffering. The other one is sort of no PPA or a, a vague PPA in the RFP process. So for us, tariffs are only relevant to adjudicate if they allocate it to a risk allocation. Um, and, and for us, that's really important because a tariff for 50 cents is great, but what does it mean? Does it mean that the buyer takes all the risk or the IPP takes the risk? Now, REAP has been really um, good in terms of that it creates that this is the answer. Um, no one really likes it, but everyone accepts it, um, and there's a lot of precedent out there, but in, in the private IPP space, there's a number of risks that are not in the control of the buyer or the IPP that under the REAP space government can take, and, and for us, it's very clearly to define those risks, and I think Jay touched on them earlier, but without those risks being clearly allocated, it's very uh, diff difficult to understand what the tariff would be. And in most of the RFPs we involved in, we have called it the acceptable PPA, which perhaps is more in favor of the buyer, but hopefully it's bankable. Different people might have opinions on that. And then you have the amended PPA, which is where the IPP then adjusts the risks and will adjust the tariff accordingly. And theoretically in a perfect world, you'll be able to then uh, see the change in the risk allocation and the impact on the tariff and by default the savings. And then you'll be able to um, objectively evaluate the change in the risk now, in reality, it doesn't always work that way because each clause doesn't have a tariff impact, but on balance, using a lot of the Cresco's experiences um, and different RFPs and different approaches, we are able to give our clients with a fair bit of accuracy and support some comfort around, if this risk is taken by you, you'll get the value 5% in the tariff equating to X million Rand in, in savings. Please, can you start wrapping up now? Cool, thank you. Um, then the, the last... Uh, Two on the list is really around proof of funding. Um, without a debt funder giving you the, uh, a, a term sheet that makes sense, they're giving you 70% of the money. Uh, you know, it's once again, just an IPP view. And then also we, we conscious that in many cases between bidding and financial close, there's a lot of time and macroeconomic issues that can happen. And this tariff adjustment mechanism that's worked really well in REAP um, for us needs to be in most tenders so that both parties get comfort that what was put in today will be into the future. 
So to finish off in summary, there's been a lot of lessons learned. Um, we're trying to take on board all these lessons learned and build them into future engagements, RFP2s, RFP3s, as they start coming out. But uh, we're quite uh, hopeful and confident that uh, a number of our projects that are perhaps been sitting in procurement or, or talked about for a number of years might actually get to financial close this year. Um, and, and for us, this is a hugely growing space. But as I mentioned, renewable procurement in its uh, inf is sort of one part of it. For most clients, they need to start looking at greater penetrations and the use of other technologies. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, really a lot to digest, and we're going to have to study those presentations of yours really clear, carefully. It's a complex subject, uh, perhaps beyond my, uh, my brain at this stage, uh, but it's absolutely critical to have specialist advice uh, like the kind that Cresco gives in order to uh, understand the issues, understand the finances, the returns, and, and make these deals happen. So uh, I, I think, uh, again, uh, uh, attendees are going to need to engage with you further. Uh, and uh, we'll be putting uh, people in touch with you uh, and uh, because it is that complex uh, a subject in order to, to get to grips with. As you say, not a short, uh, not something you can just do overnight. Uh, developers and, and these sort of things take take a significant amount of time. So thanks very much for that, Rob. Guys, it's yes. now, uh, we're well overdue time-wise, uh, but it's a, there is a desperate need for a com comfort break, certainly on my side. So I'm going to call a 10-minute comfort break, or it will be a nine-minute uh, comfort break, and ask you to reconvene at 12.45. That's, uh, sorry, at 11.45. That's quarter to 12. Uh, so if you could now uh, stretch your legs, and uh, take that welcome comfort break and be back with us at quarter to 12. Uh, the comfort break starts now. It's a total of nine minutes. So see you in due course where we will have, uh, a, you know, the, the, the further discussions. Thank you. Well, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's 12.45, so we're restarting this webinar. And now is the time uh, for our interactions uh, amongst uh, panelists, amongst uh, presenters, amongst the audience. Uh, and to kick things off, um, I'm going to be asking uh, our panelists, uh, that is uh, uh, Steve Harrison, Richard Doyle, um, uh, who else is there, Jevon Martin and Roger Baxter, who are really our panelists, uh, to give us sort of a five-minute five uh, or hopefully less opening statement. I can uh, ask everybody to keep it short because we are running quite a lot over time. Uh, so if you can make your points short and sharp, uh, and I'm going to change the order a little bit from what I originally intended um, and ask uh, if Steve Harrison, Steve, if you're ready, would you like to come on now and just give us an opening comments on what you've heard today and where Murray and Roberts fit into all of this? Uh, over to you, Steve. Sure. Thanks a lot, Chris. I, I, as, as Chris said, Steve Harrison, I'm an executive director of Murray and Roberts Limited. I'm the CEO of the Power Industrial and Water Platform. So I, I'm going to just give you some perspectives from my side uh, uh, as an EPC and as a subcontractor that's operating in this, in this renewable energy space. So after Ronald has given us grid access, after Jay has looked at all the complex legal wheeling arrangements and, 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 and statutory requirements, and after Rob has structured the whole deal, somebody still needs to engineer, procure, and construct this. And I guess the message I, I'm sending to, to, to everybody on the call as end users and clients is, from our perspective, what we would really, really value is early engagement with, with, uh, with, with end users and clients as a prospective EPC. Uh, I, think, I think EPCs are, are, are increasingly a key stakeholder in the developments. We're seeing it uh, in, in round five. You know, lenders look at the EPCs um, before they'll make investment decisions. You know, to, to couch what, what Rob said, you know, my view would be pre-selection. He talked about pre-selection of IPPs and he talked about bucket brigades and top tens. I, I, I think end users have got to look and apply the same sort of rationale to the selection or engagement with EPCs. EPCs like ourselves, uh, we've got an appetite to, to participate in development and construction financing, which could also be interesting to, into it, to the end users. Um, 
And as I say, uh, early engagement is, is, is everything for me. We can highlight any issues, any red flags. More often than not, we find ourselves as tail end Charlie. Uh, we, come, we come along at the back end. There's real, real, real constraints in, 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 the, in the supply chain at the moment. We're experiencing that on some of our projects. Escalation has spiraled. I wouldn't say spiraled out of control, but it's certainly spiraled. Um, so all, these are all considerations that need to be, need to be factored in uh, when you guys look at uh, how you're going to select ultimately the, 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 the way you're going to execute the project from an engineering procurement construction point of view. You may, as, as clients, have your own structures and a lot of the mines have their own structures and their own, own ability to manage projects. I guess the, the, the decision that you need to make fundamentally is, do, do you want to manage these projects uh, yourselves? Have you got the experience and the capacity to do that? Or, or do you want to engage with, uh, with, with, with an EPC in this space? Um, so my message quite simply is, is early engagement with the EPC We'd welcome that uh, every day of the week. Maybe the last comment in terms of capacity, uh, uh, Chris, we're, we're already engaged in, in round five. Um, we're doing some early works already on a couple of the projects. So those, those, those IPPs have already engaged us. Uh, we're on limited notice to proceed on a, on a, on a, on a couple of areas, looking at, uh, you know, looking at critical path to de-risk the schedule. Again, that's, that's quite pertinent, but there's a, an avalanche or a tsunami of, of, of projects coming in round five before we start talking about the 100 megawatt cap, round six is coming. There's a real constraint with regard to capacity in South Africa for EPCs, for the supply chain, for vendors. So I just, I just want to leave that with, 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 with everybody on the, on the, to consider on the, uh, on the call. Thanks, Chris. No, thanks, Steve. That's, I think, a really important message uh, around this uh, growing market. Uh, uh, and we're going to have to grow capacity to handle these kind of projects. Uh, but the message you've heard loud and clear uh, from Steve is to, uh, to move early and uh, secure your position. And yes, these public procurements are going to start uh, impacting and crowding out. Uh, the ability of IPPs and EPC companies and, and deal makers and uh, all the resources that the limited resource that we currently have to, to, to make things happen. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to move on to, um, uh, to Richard Doyle. Uh, Richard, I hope you're ready to make your uh, opening statement and give us your perspective as a developer. And I know a developer also in the, in the mining sector uh, and, and the energy intensive sector. So over to you, Richard, to make your point as the CEO of Dewey South Africa. Thank you very much, um, Chris, um, and for the opportunity. We're a German-owned company, and we operate internationally, which so we sort of have references to other countries, which can be quite useful. Some of them are a bit further ahead of South Africa, and others um, less so. Um, I think we've developed a reputation in the last couple of years. We've got sort of built up a head of steam building hybrid projects on, on mines in particular. We're building nine projects in mines currently, including two in Africa. That differentiates us a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, um, we, um, a de developer and an EPC, that's quite important. We, we've been developing wind and PV sites in South Africa for, for a decade now and have developed well over two gigawatts. Um, a number of those sites have been sold. Some of them have, have been built out or, already. So we've sort of gone and you know, seen that movie. Um, <clears throat> quite a number of our sites have, have also been now sterilized by, um, by the grid constraints that, uh, that we heard about in the first part of this, this session. And that's really, a, that's a very interesting and ongoing challenge for, for a number of us in the development space, now chasing the grid and trying to anticipate <laughs> where it's going to be strengthened and when it's going to be strengthened. And I, I think we'll get back to that discussion, perhaps. It's, it's maybe, maybe one of the, the key questions for, for this. We also, and consistent with what we've seen now involved, um, I mean, having developed solar and wind sites, positions us very well then to enter into discussions in, in relation, not just to wheeling, but to uh, well, in particular for, for wheeling, we're also uh, developing on on site solutions. But once you've got a, a bucket full of sites, then you know that's a platform for discussing wheeling um, solutions. And I'd say we're probably now in discussions with 15 or 20 counterparties at 
different stages of, of formal processes or bilateral negotiations, some of them with IPPs. A surprising number of them are, are with energy intensive users who are looking to procure on a direct capital investment. You know, I've been in this space for, for more than a decade now. If you come to me a decade ago and said that you know a mine or a data center would look at procuring tens of hundreds of megawatts directly rather than through an IPP, I, I wouldn't have believed it. But I, I would say about half of our projects are now direct with, with energy intensive users. Um, one of the other nuances we haven't quite got into yet, which is quite interesting, is we're working on two or three transactions that require a double wheeling transaction. In other words, wheeling on the ESCOM grid and then into one of the, the municipalities on the distribution grid into an energy intensive user there. And, and if you think that wheeling is complicated on the ESCOM grid, try and now add some uh, a municipal wheeling transaction onto that. That's a very interesting challenge. Um, some of the Munichs are, are looking at this, are relatively more advanced. Um, I, I think that they're one or two pilot projects, but none are really in, in the steady state by, by any means. Um, maybe one or, two, one or two final comments. Um, grid is still a challenge. There's no grid code for behind the meter solutions at scale where there's curtailment. We're building a project currently on a mine that's significantly delayed and some horrible potential for, for liquidated damages there if you don't sort it out. So uh, I think ESCOM is working on this, but a lot of this is still, is still new, right? So that's an important point. Um, the other is that there are lots of IPPs in the country. There are lots of contractors. I mean, we've, we've seen now a significant uptick in, in competition. Together with, the, together with the government procurement rounds, that's put massive downward pressure on, on tariffs. Um, I think there's lots of speculation remains to be seen with some of the, so some of the bit window five projects are going to close with the, those tariffs and, and I can see that mines and energy intensive users drooling at those sorts of numbers. They put lots of pressure on, on EPCs. I mean, we, you know, we, we run pretty thin margins and, and now with, let's say, you know, distribution of the quality of contractors, uh, I think it's really important that all players in the market try and, you know, choose their price performance points correctly when they choose their partners. So I think that's going to be an interesting, interesting competition. So maybe, I mean, there's lots to discuss, but that's it, it in a nutshell, Chris. Thank you. You're on mute, Chris. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks uh, for that, uh, Rob. Uh, Richard and uh, yeah, you, you you touched on the competition growing and the very low prices in the REAP sector and uh, I'm interested to, about how the differences between the REAP tariffs and the private PPA tariffs, uh, uh, you know, are something that really is worth looking at and, and why are we getting those differences. Um, so thanks for those insights, but let's now move on and we're going to now give our hosts, that is the energy intensive user group. Uh, to start off with, and then um, Roger from the Minerals Council, uh, their, their last words uh, before we really open up this discussion. Jevin, uh, your words, please. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to the presenters. Very interesting uh, conversations. Um, maybe just circling back on so some of our opening statements in terms of the benefits of private power generation. We heard from Rob in terms of what the benefits are potentially to individual uh, off takers in terms of decarbonization and commercial savings. But I think if we look at a, at a macro level, uh, we need to really push and make sure everyone in the sector understands the benefits that private generation can bring to it. Uh, first and foremost is really closing this uh, energy or electrical supply deficit in the country. We know it stands at five gigawatts already and is, is poised to grow. And, and this gives a real opportunity to help close that through the deployment of private power generation. Uh, government and the sovereign guarantee offerings, unfortunately, going to also start drying up in terms of the REAP rounds. And then that then uh, government will then turn to private sector and really ask us to come to the fore. It also helps stem some of ESCOM's costs, like the open cycle gas turbines. They've already indicated in their most recent application they intend to spend 7 billion Rand more in their next financial year just through the use of OG, OCGTs as a lack of, uh, due to lack of capacity. That can help stem the, or 
dampen the effect of you and your tariff increases. Uh, it can also help in terms of stimulating the economy, growing jobs, as well as creating a national competitive advantage for us relative to some of our uh, international peers. And I think another thing that's been pointed out by Richard, all the presenters, Jay, et cetera, is that there's a number of hurdles and the Energy Intensive User Group continues to advocate for reforms that would open up private power generation. I think governments had the expectation that sort of the 100 megawatt lifting of the generation license threshold was the silver bullet that would unleash a huge amount of projects. But unfortunately, there needs to be a realization that there's a huge amount of lead activities in order to deploy these across multiple government departments and such. And so the appeal in that respect is um, for large power users to just really get on with the process, start it, start your environmental impact assessments, start your rezoning, subdivisions, the section 53s, and then you can consider these other sort of commercial processes later uh, in parallel to your long lead items. Um, Ronald also mentioned the IRP. I think we have to advocate for more regular updating of the IRP, especially in consideration of good constraints. We need to understand where we plan to deploy uh, solar and wind in the country to, in order to strengthen the grid, ensure that we unlock the lowest costs of electricity for those projects to ensure that we remain globally competitive. We need to also advocate for a robust national wheeling framework that shows an equitable distribution of costs and transparency in that respect. The ITSMO, the Independent Transmission and System Market Operator is also gonna be key to ensure transparency and creating competition in the market and driving electricity prices downwards. And then to counter some of the PPA risks that Jay spoke about earlier around stranded assets, uh, life and mind considerations, uh, 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 load profiles, et cetera, we need to also ensure that we advocate for the ability to trade going forward. Combine the, these factors would then really open up the sector uh, for private power generation. But there is an appeal that we really progress with this in order to benefit all South Africans, not necessarily just the individual energy intensive users. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's a strong message uh, to uh, end users, uh, energy intensive users' minds to get moving, get the planning going at the early stage planning because it's not, uh, it, because it is a long process. So if you don't start now, you're not going to be ready in, in a year or two's time. So very strong message to, to make the move now, and hopefully we will reap the benefits uh, uh, for the economy, for the country, uh, and, and for the mines and industry themselves uh, as they move forward. Uh, Roger, your uh, uh, closing comments, you have the last word, which is uh, either a graveyard or a privilege, depending on how you look at it, but you've heard everything that has been said by others. Uh, what are your closing comments? So Chris, I was just wondering if your reap the benefits was a bit of an oxymoron or just a, a Freudian uh, slip given the REIPP. But anyway, sorry, that's uh, <laughs> so colleagues, listen, thanks very much. I think let me just make a couple of quick comments uh, in a very quick four minutes. Um, first comment to make is South Africa's economy cannot grow without energy. Simple as that. Uh, our current um, potential growth rate uh, is sitting at about 1%. If you look at the Reserve Bank's latest numbers, Poten potential growth is made up of fixed capital investment or, or growth in the fixed capital stock. It's made up of productivity growth, what we define as total uh, factor productivity. And it's defined as also labor uh, growth. Uh, we don't have any labor growth at the moment. Our, obviously, our jobless numbers are increasing. If you're growing at 1% per year, you can't solve any of South Africa's challenges. Um, and so one of the binding, binding constraints, all the network industries at the moment, where you're dealing with rail ports, pipelines, water, and energy are binding constraints on South Africa's productivity growth and binding constraints on our ability to grow investment in the economy. So Whatever, whichever way we look at it, um, government has run out of runway in terms of fiscal options, uh, in terms of further guarantees. ESCOM is already uh, at a debt ceiling for want of a better way of defining it. Uh, and the same can be said for all the other parastatals that are in the, the network industry uh, structures. And so without a doubt, the, this is the right time to make sure the private sector participation in energy ger generation and in rail and in ports um, if we want to unlock this economy and, and get to a much higher level of inclusive growth, and I just want to make the comment, you know, if you're growing at 5% uh, per year, you double the size of the economy in 12 years. So instead of being a $500 billion economy, 
you're suddenly sitting at a trillion dollar economy in 12 years time. So by 2034, if we were growing at 5%, you know, we have a lot more space, a lot more options, a lot less unemployed people, lost less inequality, a lot less poverty, etc. So so when I get into you know, some of the issues that we've been focusing on as the Minerals Council, and I just want to say again, in partnership with our colleagues at the EIUG, because many of our members overlap between the Minerals Council and EIUG and FAPA, the Ferro Alloy Producers Association. First, just a couple of constraints I think obviously we've highlighted and they've been put out here, and I just want to quickly summarize them, Chris. One of them is obviously the network challenges and the need for network strengthening. Uh, and I think there is a critical case here to be made about also the private sector being given some space to invest in the networks, it can't just be about uh, the transmission network only being driven by ESCOM. So that's an interesting area. And ESCOM needs to do a lot of work to get uh, access to servitudes and others to get the process flowing a lot quicker in terms of being able to strengthen the networks, both uh, in the Northern Cape, Western Cape, um, Eastern Cape. Um, uh, Jev, Jev, Jevon talked about the wheeling framework and uh, clearly that's critical. And we think uh, public enterprises Treasury, DMRE, uh, and NERSA all have a role to play there, and this has got to enable us to have an equitable uh, ultimate outcome. On the point of source connections with ESCOM, uh, we have got Mondi Bala, one of the senior general managers, working with us on trying to shorten the time periods, because remember, your e uh, cost estimate letter takes 90 days, your um, budget quote letter takes another 120 days, that's 210 days, which we don't have. So, so it's an area which uh, does need to be Sort of out environmental authorizations are simply taking far too long. I mean, may, most companies are sitting, and when Minister Mantashi keeps on asking me, he says, Hey, Roger, so where are all your companies and where's all the applications for, for, for either generating licenses or for uh, registrations? And I keep on saying to him, Minister, do you know what it takes to get to the point when you can actually apply for a registration or a license? So I think environmental authorizations is a big issue, and that includes the municipalities in, ter in terms of land zoning and other factors and the Department of Agriculture in terms of various consents, and we're working on those at the moment. In terms of the last couple of points, in terms of the, the NERSA registration process, because we are dealing here with projects up to 100 megawatts, you know, there's not a huge amount of difference between the NERSA registration process and the NERSA licensing process. You still have to pitch up at the NERSA door with virtually the PPA signed and all the details done. Uh, and so there needs to be a degree of um, uh, making the registration process a lot easier without the same level of paperwork so that companies can get on with the process. And I think that's where NERSA, you know, obviously has a critical role to play. Uh, and then I think we all need to do, my last point is, what we all need to do is also really understand that as we evolve the network, uh, as um, microgrids, as different energy sources, as different energy mixes come onto the network, it's gonna have different implications from a peak load point of view, from a energy planning perspective. And that's why this ability to trade, and it's exactly the point that uh, Jevin was making, this ability to trade in a day ahead market is going to be such a critical component of how we liberalize the energy market in South Africa. And that's something that we were thinking about in 1998 when the energy policy white paper was finalized. I was one of the four business negotiators in that. It's just a hell of a shame that it was never implemented because I think we'd be in a very different space today, uh, Chris. But uh, you can't lament on wasted opportunities. We've got to look forward and try and build the situation together. Uh, so looking forward to the comments. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Roger. And uh, what struck me was your comments about not just electricity, but all these network industries. It's not going to be enough just to sort out electricity and wheeling and trading, etc. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, and it's the same with this 100 megawatt limit. It was necessary, but it's not sufficient. There's a lot of other things that's still required to be done. Uh, but let's be thankful that that was lifted. Uh, it has, I think, given a little kickstart and momentum uh, to this process. But in the network industries, unless we sort out road transport where there are big problems and, uh, you know, with the transport of goods, uh, rail problem, we know about those. You know, every time I see a photograph of a railway station in Gauteng, my heart sinks. Water problems, the next big problem. Telecoms, we can't get on with uh you know auctioning uh, uh spectrum uh, it's, it's it's a big problem the uh, same with uh, digital terrestrial tv to re to relieve that spectrum uh, electricity we know about harbors we know about you know big problems in the harbor so unless we sort out all of these things okay but we have to sort out what we can sort out and what we can do is focus on electricity 
and 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 I do agree with you, uh, Roger. That uh, and and Jevin, when when you say that, uh, you, you know, we can relieve the burden on Eskom, and I don't believe that that's going to reduce Eskom's sales of energy. <laughs> it's going to enable the country to grow, and at the moment, the country is restrained, and energy is one of those uh, restraints, and we cannot grow this economy without electricity. So. The more we can relieve Eskom uh, of its burden, the more uh, capacity will be available uh, to grow the economy. Uh, so I see this as a positive thing. So uh, thank you all for your input. And really, it is now time to open this up. So first thing just to say is if any of the attendees today would like to pose a question to any of the uh, panelists and presenters today, please put up your hand. Uh, I'm watching uh, the hands uppers. And I will come to them in, in, in due course. So uh, you really are requested to uh, don't be shy uh, to stick up your hand uh, and ask your question. Um, there have been a fair number of questions on the uh, uh, Q&A chat, uh, of which I see that seven of them have actually been answered uh, in text form by one or other of our presenters or panelists. And that's really great because that relieves the burden uh, of me to have to deal with each and every question. So some of these questions have, have been dealt with, uh, but um, I'm going to move to the ones that have not been dealt with uh, while I'm waiting for people uh, to put up their hands. Uh, so so, Chris, please, I can, so yeah, Chris, I please. can answer one very quick one. I think uh, yeah. uh, Conry uh, Mulman uh, was asking the question, how much capacity are we looking at? Certainly from the Minerals Council members side, we have a project pipeline from the membership of those companies that have given us details of 3.9 gigawatts of renewables. Uh, those run out to about 2027. Uh, some of them could be brought forward a lot closer, but again, grid, uh, you know, grid tie constraints, environmental constraints, and obviously uh, network constraints are some of the critical factors that are coming in play. And I, I must give credit to uh, the ESCOM team for agreeing the concept of potentially allowing some sites close to existing power stations that are going to be phased out with uh, almost immediate uh, connection to the networks and obviously hopefully expedited other procedures could create some space for companies to you know, invest in Pumalanga, et cetera. Yeah, great. That is really helpful, um, uh, uh, Roger, uh, to just deal with ones that you can deal with quickly. And may I say that to any of the other presenters and panelists, please, uh, you can switch on your cameras now. Uh, it's good to see everybody who's uh, here to field uh, uh, questions and answers, so please feel free to switch on your cameras, uh, but sweet, keep your mics off until you're going to speak, uh, otherwise it sometimes causes uh, some uh, some problems. Um, yeah, just a, a question here, I think maybe it, it could be addressed to, uh, to to Ronald, who's a grid person, uh, and, and, and talk about grid uh, uh, and distribution uh, security, uh, and here I'm talking about, uh, you know, theft and vandalism, and how is this impacting on the grid? Uh, I mean, we've seen you know, theft and vandalism in the rail sector, absolutely decimating the rail sector. Is this one of the challenges that we have to deal with uh, at the grid and also at the distribution level? Uh, uh, this is a question <coughs> asked by Rian Blina. Yes, it is an ongoing and escalating problem. Uh, it, it's not... Um, it's not confined to distribution. Uh, we've had a number of towers on the transmission fall over because of theft of tower members. Um, and we've also had various uh, intrusions on substations where uh, well-armed uh, uh, people come and steal uh, copper and et cetera in the substations itself. So um, the there's a very high focus on uh, improving security um, and also looking at designs of equipment that can mitigate um, uh, desire to, to steal different components. And so those are, are uh, um, underway, but it is a significant problem for security of supply. Thank you. Well, while you're there, Robert, just stay on uh, because uh, there's a, two other questions I think probably are best answered by you. And, and, and uh, uh, first of all, I, I just would like to try and find out um, this question of when is a deal secured in terms of 
grid access uh, and how does it compare between public procurements and private uh, procurements i mean from from what i've heard in the public space when preferred bidders are announced their connection is secure and secured with ESCOM, even though they haven't paid their budget uh, quote yet even though they haven't even achieved financial closure yet but they safe whereas in the private sector you have to tick every box and every permit and everything has to be in place uh, before you can uh, uh, and you pay your money to ask them before you can uh, uh, secure your grid access but so i'm really asking of this question about leveling level playing fields and uh, and is ESCOM treating customers fairly both private sector procurements and public sector okay so um the license conditions gives open access to everybody which which is a double-edged sword um, it then allows anybody to come in and apply so we do not treat anybody differently for grid access in other words internally to escom when they want to develop a project they have to apply just like any other ipp all right they have to follow an ice they have to pay money they have to etc cetera, etc cetera. so there, there's no discrimination of the way in which we treat any customer applying at any point but this does result in competition at points and so um, it, there's no discrimination either between the public procurement and the private procurement if you get grid access uh, once you get everybody gets an ice um, once you've got a uh, request a budget quote and you've paid your money for a budget quote capacity is reserved but not allocated it is only allocated at the point where you conclude the total budget quote and all uh, agreements are signed that's when it would be that's when it will be allocated but if an ipp comes in and they sign a budget quote um, uh, uh, um, it is res it is res reserved at that point. It's allocated, but not allocated. Generally, when we do the GCCA document, when the preferred bidders are announced, um, very often shortly after that, they, they actually pay their budget quotes and so forth. So we do include uh, that capacity to identify in in the GCCA document. Um, and any private um, IPP would also be included. So in the GCCA document, we actually include how much, we don't give names or anything, but we give what capacity has been allocated at each substation. And this is included in the, in the GCCA document itself. So, so to, 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 to a simple answer is everybody gets treated the same. The point, uh, everybody gets an ICE, and everybody needs to pay money for their budget code to lock in a res reserve capacity and allocation only happens once you have concluded the, the, the budget uh, quote itself. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I hope that reassures people and also answers Precious and Papella's question about site location and how does that uh, uh, sort of weigh in the ranking of, of, uh, of areas to be considered for access or granting yeah, yeah. of, of access. So Chris, just so, before uh, Ronald gets off. Yep. Uh, Chris, just before Ronald gets off, I, I guess there's, there's quite a few questions coming through from some of the team members um, in the audience on the strengthening of the grid. Obviously, Ronald, you talked about uh, the ideas of trying to locate, obviously, uh, some demand um, on some of the grid points, which would obviate the need for strengthening the networks. But obviously, most of the large scale industrial activities are obviously in Gauteng, uh, more Gauteng based. So just any timelines? I mean, we've heard about Andre yeah. Dureta saying... 10 years, 100 billion rand or 50 billion rand or something like that. Can you give us some sense of that? That's to, RP, to, to answer Yopi Fullard's uh, question, if you don't mind. Thanks. Okay, so at least a minimum of 100 and 140 billion is closer to the number over a 10-year window. The, the strengthening is, is it's very difficult to give firm dates. I know people want firm dates, but our biggest constraint is, is not the environmental um acquisition but the actual acquisition of the land so negotiating with land uh, landovers over 1000 kilometers is a very difficult task and uh we've had multiple um uh complications where particular land owners just simply refuse to to allow access or, or sign an agreement 
and they end up in court and they can be extended for long durations of time. We've had periods of over seven to 10 years to try and negotiate a, a route, a, a servitude over property. So our, we, we, we're very hesitant always to give dates because we get held to the dates, but that's the biggest risk at this, this moment. And, and ESCOM does not have expropriation to rights for, for building uh, land, which complicates uh, the matter. But generally um, the timeline, so we will be updating the TDP document in the next uh, week or two, which will provide all the uh, anticipated timelines that we want, that we that we have, but uh, the generally uh, EIA takes about a, a year or two. Land negotiation takes about two to three years if you're lucky. Okay, as I said, it could be extended, and then construction takes about two to three years. So uh, uh, we'll be lucky to get it in six to seven years time uh, to execute the the, the projects. Uh, and, and this is the big constraint that, that we're actually building. Uh, we can construct the, the lines. I mean, one of the, the misconceptions is that ESCOM builds all of the stuff. The reality is ESCOM builds nothing. All of the lines are given out to the private sector. So ESCOM just does the, 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 the designs, it accesses the land, and then it puts out to procurement to the private sector to build all the all the lines. So all the lines are actually uh, built by the private sector. And uh, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned earlier, capacity is a big concern for us because the volumes of lines that we have to build and the speed at which we have to build is a, is a big concern. So um, uh, the, the Northern Cape, we, we hope to get somewhere around 27 to, to 29 uh, and the remaining Cape corridors as well are in the same kind of uh, framework at this stage. We, uh, we've been appealing to the, the community in the industry to assist with acquisition and because uh, al along these corridors, there are multiple IPPs who, who have good arrangements with, uh, with the landowners and this could assist in speeding up the, the, the process. But, but these are the biggest uh, constraints that we have. Um, the one question that was about building out the distribution networks, um, to, to a large extent, uh, a, a lot of the distribution networks are actually built by IPPs who do self-build because it's fairly easy to do that. They acquire the servitudes and, and they process it. What we're looking at, though, is trying to coordinate because of the volumes of, of, of uh, renewables at a point, um, really to have a collector network stations and conversations with clusters of IPPs around a point to better understand the optimal routes to minimize the cost at these points. And, and, and those are really discussions with, with all the people that, that, we, that we're looking for. Um, Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Arnold. Look, uh, I, I want to just uh, come to a question uh, by Dimitri Godin uh, and oppose this to Jay. Uh, and, and that is, are things greatly simplified when uh, you know, when a developer or an IPP or even the mine builds its own uh, its own uh, renewable energy plant with battery storage uh, on its own site on its own land, um, maybe there's a contract needed between the IPP and the off taker, but but it's all behind the meter, as it were. Uh, does this make things a lot simpler in in, in the whole process? And uh, yeah, I was fascinated to hear about uh, how, how many, uh, I think Richard Doyle mentioned that a lot of uh, mines are, are actually uh, going to do it themselves, as it were, um, and not uh, do it through an IPP. I presume that means they're probably very cash flush with the current upcycle in the uh, commodity market and the mining sector. They got the cash. Uh, to spend the capex and build it on their own uh, capital reserves, uh, but can you answer how easy is it? Uh, is it easier just to do it on your own site? Jay, um, thanks. So it's not easier, Chris. Mm. I hope the sound issue has been sorted out, no. um, because one must realize that the only exemption that the market has been granted is an exemption on a generation license or if applicable, the transmission facility that's built from up to the point of connection. 
you, the market doesn't have exemptions on the remainder of the compulsory legal requirements that need to be in place. So you have your environmental consents and approvals to get, you get your way these acquisitions, it's all the project site enablement issues, uh, you know, securing use, possession, ownership, looking at whether that land is fit for purpose, rezoning, consolidation, uh, you know, changing the all of that from a legal perspective, because lenders would look for, especially in these ring fenced arrangements, it's a dedicated project, it's ring fenced, it needs to be, um, as I mentioned, fit for purpose for the project. So, sorry, it's not easier. And in fact, as I mentioned, because it's private sector, we don't necessarily have the ear of the issuing authorities to be able to at least fast track them giving it attention, not fast tracking the legislative process, but just having an ear. Thanks. Yeah, that, that is sobering. Uh, of course, I hope it would eliminate the need for complicated wheeling contracts and changes uh, in that area. Uh, but it sounds like there's still a lot of uh, issues and it doesn't simply make the project easy if you can do it on your own land uh, uh, behind the meter and enter into arrangements between generators and off takers uh, on their own property. So a really interesting answer there. Uh, uh, colleagues, and then I don't see any hands up uh, to ask questions. Please don't be shy. If you've got a question, uh, it, it's sometimes easier just to put up your hand and, and ask it verbally. We've got the team on standby uh, here. Uh, I do see also quite a lot of the questions uh, have been answered already. Uh, but uh, are there any other questions and people that want to put up their hand? Uh, I'm just looking to see which ones we have not handled. We've talked about the permitting there. Uh, a question here about the, uh, as a potential measure of success of 100 megawatt threshold set by government, do we know how much self-generation the energy intensive users have planned thus far and whether there's a ramp up? I think Roger has kind of answered that question that they've increased their the aspiration from 1,600 megawatts not so long ago to 3,900, which is a very dramatic increase in, the, in, in what they are planning over the, the next, say, eight years or so. Uh, and am I right in understanding, Roger and Jevon, that doesn't include Sassel. Uh, that's just the mines, because you're Roger Baxter yep. from the Mining Council, the Mineral Council. So. If you were to add in some of the industries that are not mines, like Samanco and Sassel and, uh, and others, uh, and for example, municipalities who are talking about contracting with IPPs, this sector you know, could maybe deliver you know, six or 7,000 megawatts uh, relatively easily. Um, you know, obviously, there are the regulatory and, and, and the bureaucratic hurdles to overcome, but this doesn't seem to be any lack of appetite. Am I right? Chris, so, so let me start first, and I'm sure Jeb will come in uh, straight after, is that absolutely, I mean, listen, there are a number of the energy intensive users that are not included in that particular equation. The 3.9 gigawatts uh, is, we're looking at about a 60 to 70 billion rand capital investment by the sector. So that's not insignificant in its own right. It would create a lot of employment, a lot of uh, investment and growth in the economy. But the most important thing is it would be so enabling from the company perspective, because this is supplemental supply, but it also acts as a degree of a price hedge against uh, massive escalation in prices. And I mean, obviously, one can see <laughs> the price uh, request from ESCOM at the moment. So I think it's, it's a heck of a, I think the 3.9 gigs obviously underestimates what companies will do. They want to see some early successes. And we have seen some success coming through the Goldfields uh, investment in their 42 megawatt plant. Um, we're going out there next week. Hopefully, we'll have a look at it and uh, see see the progress that they're making. But you know, you need some early successes, and then you need we need to do some work in really shortening the timelines and getting these projects going at a much faster pace. And that's where government has to come to the party. I mean, I, I just wanted to say, you know, the comment that Ronald made on the strengthening of the of the network around expropriation. You know, government needs to come to the party. They need to start also enabling. Uh, they have the legislative and constitutional responsibility to enable growth in the economy, and maybe this is something where they should be more involved. But Quick comment from my side, Jeff. Yes, completely concur, Roger. I think uh, despite all the hurdles that have been covered today, I think we're going to be seeing an explosion of announcements this year by private sector players in terms of their own use projects. So I think in that respect, it's going to be very positive. I, I think there is 
unfortunately it's going to still going to take a long time for these projects to come online so for the next couple of years we're going to sit in this precarious situation where we remain in the energy supply deficit uh, but it'll be interesting to watch into the future as more and more projects come online and as supply gap closes sort of how ESCOM reacts from a competition perspective because they'll then start scrambling to fight for uh, sales again but I think in that respect large power users are in partnership with ESCOM we recognize their financial sustainability is core to our own so we work very closely with them in, in contemplating these different scenarios and, and ensuring their, their sustainability and Chris, I don't know if you would uh, uh, indulge in questions between panelists, but I'd almost sure. like to put one to Ronald to say, sure. in, in terms of the good constraints, does ESCOM foresee that it will stifle the rollout of the IRP, and, and has that been communicated to governments for their for their own planning? Ronald, do you want to step in here? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so um, the grid has enough capacity for the IRP and would need to develop with the TDP aspirations. So, but what would, what would happen is that the re resource rich areas will be constrained. So the areas where there is some additional capacity where the resources are not as favorable would have to be taken up. So uh, it doesn't constrain the, the, um, the IRP, but what it does is it will put price pressures because you won't get the optimal um, resources that are potentially there if, if the grid was unlocked. Thanks. Uh, look, I'd like to just bring in Steve uh, and, and Richard uh, at this point. Uh, but before I do, before I do, I, I, let me just get back to Jevin and ask him this. Jevin Rogers stuck his neck out and said that they have, uh, you know, they're going to commit, commit to 3.9 gigawatts from the mining industry alone. Can you give us a commitment or at least a, a guess at the non, the non mining uh, uh, energy intensive sector? What, what, what is their equivalent uh, commitment uh, in, in terms of gigawatts, just roughly, uh, do you have a gut feel for that sort of thing? I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about municipal sector with IPP, just the energy intensive non-mining companies. What, what can they bring to the table? Chris, uh, we are still doing that homework ourselves and we did issue our survey amongst our members. And unfortunately, um, members are somewhat reluctant to disclose their uh, anticipated projects because of the sort of different stages that they're in. But we also, uh, outside of our common members, there are probably one or two gigawatts in the pipeline. Um, and we, we're hoping to get more clarity on that as they progress their projects and they're willing to disclose them more publicly. But I think in that regard, it is a, a positive number for the country. Good. Yeah, so, okay, add those two together and then add the municipal sector together and you're talking about a big number. And now my question to, to you, uh, Steve, uh, and, 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 and Richard is, is, is uh, can you guys cope? You, I mean, you did mention this avalanche that is coming. Uh, and I'm not just talking about Murray and Roberts and, and not just talking about Dewey, uh, but can the developers and the EPCs and the uh, contractors uh, cope with this avalanche that is coming, assuming Eskim is not the constraint? Uh, maybe putting that into kind of two contexts. So, so the work around the renewables um, as I said to you earlier, Chris, we're, what, what we can see, we've got real visibility on projects now, and, and we really believe that we, as I said, we've already got going on to, uh, and there's more. So there is a real, real, real capacity constraint around just this round five renewables. That's that's the reality of it. I mean, you know, the, 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 there was a few well-established companies in, in South Africa and, and large construction companies who, who've been decimated over the last few years, um, and, and the turn is really starting to happen now. So what's keeping the MD of, of our transmission and distribution company awake at the moment is, is capacity um, and skills and it's supply chain. Um, you know, Ronald was talking about um, uh, how ESCOM contracted in the transmission space. Just for some context there, there's only four approved vendors who can, who can execute 400 kV transmission work. There's, there's one approved vendor who can supply the tower steel in South Africa in the South African context. So if there isn't, if, if we've got to do all of this, somebody really, really, really needs to look 
at the capacity, not only amongst the engineering, procurement, construction companies, but the supply chain as well. Mm -hmm. That is the reality. So while all these issues around uh, way leaves uh, uh, and, and, and access and land rights are being sorted out, somebody needs to take a really, really, really good look at capacity in this country from a engineering, procurement, construction, but also the supply chain, structural steel uh, and the like. Um, so that, that, that for me, as I say, while we've got a transmission company, that's fantastic. It's all really exciting. 10 years, 130 billion. I can go play golf. You know, <laughs> I, 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 but uh, it, it's, it, it, the reality is capacity is becoming a major, major issue from where I'm sitting. Uh, Richard, do you want to add to that uh, from your perspective uh, as a developer, as an EPC yourself? You had, to, you had to sign off, Chris. You had to sign off hard stuff at half past. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so Richard had to sign off, unfortunately. Well, I think Steve can speak almost on behalf of him because uh, a lot of what uh, Dewey do, uh, 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 Steve does as well. And I, I understand they even collaborate with each other uh, yeah. in, in, in various aspects. Um, uh, so sorry that uh, Richard wasn't able to come in there, but ladies and gentlemen, we kind of have reached the end of uh, the uh, allocated time uh, until 12.30. I don't see any hands up. I'm not sure that we've handled all the questions, but I wanted to just say what I've already said again. And that is in this kind of engagement, uh, we can only introduce the topics. Uh, we can, I mean, 20 minutes to discuss the legalities around uh, uh, infrastructure and energy is putting Jay in a difficult spot uh, and and she's got a lot of stuff up there uh, to share with you. So uh, one of the purposes of today is to enable uh, people in the mining and energy intensive sector uh, to be in touch with people that can really uh, offer good advice uh, with a lot of experience and knowledge. Uh, so uh, people like um, uh, Rob Vata, People like uh, Steve, people uh, like Richard Doyle um, and Jay and, and Ronald, uh, you know, on the Eskom side, uh, you know, are, are really at your disposal um, and we're going to put them at your disposal. Uh, so we're going to follow up with all the presentations to you with a link uh, to view this, not only to the people that, re that attended, but also to all the people that registered, but a few were not able to attend. And, um, and, and this is the beginning of an engagement and a conversation uh, and it's not the end but it's an introduction and I hope you will grasp what is uh, the challenge that Roger and uh, Jevon have put out that this thing we need to start moving uh, early now in order to reap the benefits for your own company uh, for, for all customers in South Africa because the more we can relieve us of the burden the more we can allow this economy to grow and the more sales that Eskom can make. So I don't see this as a, as a, a death spiral, uh, as sometimes it is presented, that this private generation is, is the end of Eskom. No, no, no. It's actually, it's, 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 it's working, I believe, in everybody's interest. And I, and, and I think it's all of, in all of our interests that the economy should grow. Uh, and, and that is what this will enable. And as Roger so aptly pointed, uh, we are just part of the solution in the electricity sector. There's all these other network industries that have also got to do their job, come to the table and sort out the rail and the road and the telecoms and harbors and, and all the other things that are constraining uh, South Africa's growth at the moment. But we can only do what we can do. And this is our sector that we're in. And, and uh, uh, I think we should have a positive outlook. Uh, these are, there are these green shoots that I alluded to in my uh, opening statements uh, that, uh, uh, that, I, uh, that I see. Um, and. Uh, and, and we need not to get uh, stuck on the doom and gloom, but look to growing these green shoots and making them flower and grow into trees. Uh, and, and there's a lot happening. I'm very heartened with Eskom's new vision uh, coming from its, uh, its new management and team. I'm heartened by people like Ronald, uh, who really deeply understand uh, the issues, both the problems and what needs to be done. So let's all work together and make this happen. And thank you to all our attendees for attending. And you'll be hearing from me shortly with the follow up uh, feedback report, links, uh, presentations and all of that, uh, together with the contact details of all the presenters and panelists that have been on today. So thanks, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you.